have the order, the proposed order that you gave me. Uh, I haven't uploaded it yet. I assume, but I will have the clerk's office. The clerk is going to come up. Uh, I tried to make copies this morning for everybody, but I should never be allowed to use those machines. Um, <laughs> the fortunate thing is it didn't shred the document or anything, but uh, it kept shutting down. So uh, I, so I have the original, and I have one copy, and I will get other copies, but we'll have it uploaded. I don't. I I'm going to upload it with the letter, if unless you. Want otherwise? If you wish you wanted, that's fine. I just know that that's typically in our office. That's what we know the board needs: the actual written authorization. So, um, if you would like to upload those two, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, boy, can you make an extra copy of this, uh, and then I will. I, I will do that, and I assume it does not need to be under seal. I'll give you a copy, and then I'm going to upload the original. And Here. I'll give you. so we just need one other copy, I guess. Um, also, it's my understanding um, we did the clerk's office did cancel the transport for Mr. Harju, yes, uh, but it's also my understanding that he refused transport. So we may need a some kind of additional order on that. Mr. Harju? Oh, okay. Yeah, he was, it was canceled, but I, I, I don't know. They may have gotten the cancellation, the communication about the cancellation transmitted after they were planning on tra transporting him. So it isn't an issue for today, but it sounds like it's going to be an issue. So I guess Probably the, the best thing, Your Honor, would be that um, the state probably draft the pleading in regards to the understanding that he had refused transport, uh, restating again what we anticipate his testimony to be, and asking him if his uh, transport would be held. Um, but we can draft that up over the weekend and get it into the court tomorrow. Um, and ideally, I think um, the state can, once we are at the end of the day, I think the state would better know what its order of witnesses are going to be for Monday. We hear some witnesses that are going to take a bit short time on Monday. Um, but if we can squeeze them in Monday afternoon, that would be, we will let you know, I think, then. And if not, then we can plan it out for Wednesday so that at least gives Mr. Harger a little bit more time to think about what he wants to do. Right. Though it's not really a choice. No. Um, I should say how he wishes to behave. Okay. Um, all right. We, I had you all come in a little earlier so that we could discuss any issues with Mr. LaBelle. We have Attorney Duckett here. Good morning. Hi. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. And then the then the original will go downstairs and it will get uploaded into the. Can I say, Your Honor, I yes. have talked to Mr. Duckett, so I'm not insisting that Mr. LaBelle will be here okay. based on what Mr. Duckett is going to say to you. Okay, thank you. I did ask if you wanted him brought up for this, uh, but if you don't need to, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. He is feeling better. Uh, he is a little light sensitive, but would we'll prefer the lights on. Would we'll prefer the lights on. Okay. The lights on, um, and he's ready to go. Okay. Um, and so, is there any need to? One of the issues was the state saying that you may want it. I think at this point, Your Honor, that we can, there, there, there was no report. There, he hasn't been seen by medical, and he doesn't want to be at the prison. There's no report about this. OK. Um, doesn't want to be seen by medical, doesn't want to report made, doesn't want an investigation. OK. So in that case, Your Honor, I think I'll just ask him if he's comfortable testifying today. And I think I do need to make sure that he is fit and able to testify tomorrow. So I think I've got to ask at least one or two questions to make sure that he's comfortable. I, although I understand from Attorney Duckett that he feels that he is ready to testify and he's able to talk here today. Just, I, I guess what I would say is ask the standard questions that you would ask 
in the event that you're going to go any further than that, uh, I want you to approach the bench so that we can have a conversation about that. You know, just just be. It's not my intent right now. I mean, based upon Attorney Duncan's representations, I accept those, and we'll just proceed as we have originally. Right. I guess the question is, if you ask him a preliminary question, you know, oftentimes people do not want to testify. Let's say he answers, yeah, I would rather not be here. I don't want to testify. Is there any reason not to move on after that? No. Okay. That, okay, that, that, that's really, I think, the question. Um, okay. I guess that's it. Anything else preliminary? No? All right, very good. All right, Your Honor, I think we do. I think nothing else oh. with regards to uh, uh, Mr. Lavelle. Okay. That's that's resolved. I think there are two other um, quick things that, are, that we probably should discuss um, before we get started, only because I anticipate that um, one of them will require uh, some consideration maybe over the lunch break when we have some talk about what to do this week based on the pleading that I saw come in from the Schmau Garcia's counsel late last night. I saw in my email this morning that apparently he's filed a motion for a Richards hearing. Uh, I wish I could file one this morning, but he heard the seven last night. Um, I got it from the, the email. Um, so I did see that that came in. Uh, obviously, I think that's something that we're going to have to consider what the timing would be of when we would be able to have that hearing if that's what he is now asking for. That was not my understanding before we talked about that, I believe, back uh, prior to jury selection. Our understanding that he was going to be testifying consistent with his grand jury uh, testimony. Uh, Attorney Shepard has now filed that matter. Did he send that by email to both of you? I just got it through e filing, Your Honor. I didn't get a direct email. You yeah. got it through e filing? Oh, did you get it through e filing? Because I, I, I see. Maybe didn't it's... check my e filing this morning, Jeff. Right. I was on the road. What? We're still in file and serve mode. Right, but if it was still in file and serve, I don't see why Attorney Ogadi would have gotten it. Well, they get, they, once they serve it, here it is. It's it. It's been processed now. Once they serve it, they get it, even though we can't see it. Don't you? I have to check. I, I thought that you, if, if you're a service contact, you get a copy of it. It could be processed. I see. Okay. So that may be why. Okay. What it is in now? Just for clarification, Your Honor, it looks like uh, this came into my inbox somewhere around 1137 or 1136. Yeah. Okay, so well, it wouldn't have it. I wouldn't have seen it because it wouldn't get processed, and I can't see them. But apparently, you still can. Attorney Smith, I can print this out so you have a copy of it too. Here. Let's just see. But it is in the file now. This one. Can you print? Oh, I guess. Yeah. I can. can you print it to this one? Otherwise, I want to print it to all to the other one. I'm sorry, I can't print from this computer. Okay. Um, um, I do have a but the, uh, printed copy from this morning. Here it is. Sarah oh. print. Yeah. I my box. Okay, actually, if they have a printed copy, we can just put through the copier here. I will confess, Your Honor, I haven't read it more than the top line, and mm -hmm. Sarah Relief. Uh, hit the pin button. Yeah, we're not, we're not prepared to deal with this at all, I think. I just want to flag it for the court if we talk about what else. No, I'm glad. I'm glad because it might just scheduling wise. Uh, let me just. I'm just taking a look at it. Hang on one second. Here. And when were you thinking you were going to call him? Not till, oh well, obviously not till next week. And not till the end of the state's case, so the... I anticipate Wednesday, Thursday. Is that Wednesday? Wednesday, Thursday. Okay, 
so I mean I think we should schedule a hearing if we end up not needing it great but I but given the docket you know it's possible what we could do is so that we don't have to interfere with what we have scheduled here I could do it Tuesday morning um, so I could do it Tuesday morning which is what I'm sorry I've just sort of made other arrangements when you said that we wouldn't be coming in Tuesday so okay that's okay well if we can't we can't Okay. Um, are your other arrangements all day? They're changeable. <laughs> what? Absolutely changeable. So, will you tell me? I mean, otherwise, I think, well, I guess we could do it, er, you know, earlier on one of our trial days without necessarily interfering with our trial schedule. Um, but I, I do have, so I can't do it in the afternoon on Tuesday. Um, but I could do it Tuesday morning, but if that doesn't work. It was a gasp on my part, just I was surprised, at, but I can accommodate whatever the court decides. I can be here on Tuesday morning. Would you rather do that than change what you have? And I don't know, if the state, can the state do it Tuesday morning? That's fine. Okay, would you rather do that or would you rather do it early I would on another day? Rather do it early, but yeah. Um, Time. Yeah, I mean, we could just do it Monday morning um, if we can get get Attorney Shepard here. Okay. Um, yeah, he would have to actually. Mr. Guy, you have the docket number on that? Yes. And this, this, Mr. Garcia, is he incarcerated or not? In, is, is Mr. Garcia incarcerated? incarcerated? No. no, okay. So we would need him here too. Um, which means he, I don't know if he needs a subpoena to get here. Right. So uh, he has been subpoenaed for trial. Um, as of as of any particular day, is he under? Is he? But I mean, I'm sorry. Is he under subpoena starting? I have somebody nodding in the back for From you. From the beginning of the trial for every day thereafter with a letter that we will call you when we know the day that we're going to call you. So yes. Okay, so you <clears throat> can get him here on Monday morning. I mean. I would certainly have to go through Attorney Shepard. And um, maybe at lunch we can address it again after lunch to see if Attorney Shepard can be here with his client. And if it's not enough notice before the weekend, then do it Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, don't do it. Yeah, we're going to, uh, the clerk will email him to see if he can do it. What time, what time do we decide on Monday morning? 8, 8.15, you're coming far. I will, Is that? I will be here. Um, okay. So we, we'll check with him now to make sure that uh, he's able to be here Monday morning. If not, then my preference would be Tuesday if it's not, um, if it's not too big of an inconvenience or challenge. Okay. You had one other? Um, I did one. But we had, um, um, you had asked, and I apologize because I don't believe yesterday just getting started with the trial uh, but you had asked for um, specifically Joshua Zimmerman oh, to be asked. Oh that Mr. Montgomery will have to be here today. Okay. Um, can I hear it and then we can repeat it? Oh it's it's the Josh Zimmerman reconsideration. It, right can I just okay. as long as we're here and we can repeat it when he comes up or? Sure. Okay just go ahead. You had asked for water and then Mr. Zimmerman and he asked specifically which house that he, uh, which home that Adam Montgomery had been in when he had allegedly had that rifle. That, that as you recall, uh, Mr. Zimmerman wasn't sure if it was an AK-47 or an AR-15. He did initially say AK-47 was coming from police. Later on said he didn't know the difference between the two, which term he used. And 
stated that he would be hiding guns in walls. Uh, you would ask that he specifically be asked whether or not that was at the Guilford Street address. Um, he was a, a phone call that was made uh, by Detective Dunleavy as well as uh, Assistant Attorney General Rolls to ask him that question that afternoon um, at the end of the 31st. Um, and during that, the Manchester Police Department has generated a report on that phone call, and I'll just read it to you. Um, they asked him whether or not he recalled the conversation he had with Adam Montgomery in relation to the ATF being after him and Adam dropping some guns. He said, when we recalled the conversation, he stated that a significant other, Tara Hilbert, was with him. He recalled Adam stated that the ATF was after him because he used to sell guns. Zimmerman stated that his understanding was this was something Adam had done in the past while he was on Guilford Street. Zimmerman was unsure if Adam had bought or sold guns, though, while living on 644 Union Street, where he was living at the time the conversation was taking place. Zimmerman Wait, I'm sorry, can you just say that last, yes. last sentence again? The, that's the location where... No, no, but just read what it was. Oh. Uh, the Union Street. 644 Union Street. Right, but just could you reread re -read that sentence? Yes, Your Honor. I'll start from that, that, that sentence before and take it from there. Um, he recalled Adam stating that... Zimmerman stated that his understanding was this was something Adam had done in the past when living on Guilford Street. Zimmerman was unsure if Adam had bought or sold guns while he was on 644 Union Street. I see. Zimmerman stated the conversation he and Tara had with Adam happened a few months into Adam and Kayla living on Union Street. Uh, Zimmerman noted that he didn't really start talking to Adam until then, and on this day in particular, Adam, quote, spilled his guts, end quote. We thanked him for continuing time to speak with us and ended the call. Right. So he was asked that specific question. Thank you. I'll wait. I'm sorry. I'll just wait until Mr. Montgomery. I just wanted to hear what the information was. I can think about it, but we'll wait until we have Mr. Montgomery. We um, we don't need to deal with that today, or we do? Um, potentially this afternoon. I don't think this warrants a lot. Um, I think that that's something that I, I'm happy to restate on the record when, well, on record again, uh, when Mr. Montgomery gets up here to let the him know and obviously as they know what that answer was. Um, but we do not anticipate calling uh, Mr. at this point. I don't know. This is Mr. Zimmerman. I'm sorry, Mr. Zimmerman at this yeah. point. I don't know that I don't think we will get to him uh, until after the lunch. Okay. So um, we can do it at lunch. Yes, uh, that work for you? Okay. All right. Uh, do we have is everybody here? Yes, yes. Um, okay. Is Everybody ready, or do you want a quick break before we start? Oh, a lunch. Okay. A lunch. I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. But yes, I will need to walk down the hall for a minute. Okay. Um, all right. So everybody, have a drink of water, take a restroom break. We'll bring them in as soon as we're all back gathered, which should be in just a minute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
seated. Do we should we be bringing the witnesses witness up right now? Well, they, we should probably bring them before the jury gets to the Oh, okay. So we need Mr. LaBelle. Okay. Do you want to just have him on the stand? Start him on the stand? That might be because I know he's going to be, that's my understanding, he's going to be wearing the leg brace. Okay. But I think that'll come in the face. So but if you want to stand, he's not walking. That's fine, but it's not a secret that he's incarcerated. No, Your Honor. Okay, yeah. so yeah. When, it, when it comes time for him to get off the stand, we can just That's send him off the stand. Okay. Uh, and thank you to the Sheriff's Department for getting him here on time this morning. So. so they're bringing him now? Okay, perfect.
Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to bring in the jury. We're all just going to stand for the jurors when they arrive. Um, is everyone ready? All right. Please rise for the jurors. Um, do you want him to stay seated, or it's fine? He can be seated if you want. Yeah. Why don't you just be seated? Sir? Rise for the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <coughs> Is the state ready to proceed with its next witness? Yes, sir. Given previous conversation with the court, we would ask that the witness be allowed to remain seated while taking the oath. Yes, you may remain seated while taking the oath. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Lavelle. Please raise your right hand. I solemnly swear that the testimony you will give this jury will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Yes. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Since we're being uh, and we are on the record today, would you please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Kevin Bell, L A B E L L E. And is all of your last name um, a capital L, a small B, or is it a capital B? It's a capital B. Capital B. I want to make sure that we get it right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Mr. Lebel, currently, um, are you currently serving a parole setback sentence at the New Hampshire State Prison for Men? Yes. And have you been convicted of uh, several felonies over the years? Yes. Let me ask you, um, how long have you been a resident of Manchester before you were at the New Hampshire State Prison? All my life. All my life. And how old are you now, sir? 31. Okay. Let me ask, in... 2019, October of 2019. Uh, back then, where were you living? Uh, my mom's house, 227 Patterson Street. I'm sorry, did you say 227? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, if you can't hear me at all, please let me know. I'll be glad to speak up, because if you can't hear me, then I know the jurors can't hear me either. How do you know uh, Adam Montgomery? How did you first meet him? Um, I was riding my bike and I met him. Uh, he was asking me about the tattoo on the back of my leg. Okay. And when was that in 2019? What time of year? Uh, Sustained. What time of year did you first meet him? I just can't recall right now. Um, so long ago. Okay. Do you remember, you said you were riding your bike though? Yeah. So I want to say it was, you know, maybe fall time. Maybe fall time. Uh, do you know where he was living in Manchester at that time? Uh, Guilford Street. Uh, do you remember the number of Guilford Street? I don't remember the number, no. And did you spend any time with each other? Hanging out, things like yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. Um, when you were spending time with each other, did you use any drugs with each other? Yeah. Okay. What did you use? Uh, crack cocaine. And what did you see him use during that time? Uh, crack cocaine, heroin. In October of 2019, what, if anything, did Adam Montgomery offer to sell you? Uh, a shotgun and an AR-15. A shotgun and an AR-15? Yep. Okay. Um, did you see the shotgun and the AR-15? Yes. Okay. Describe for me, what did the shotgun look like? Uh, it was a black shotgun, had a scope on it, um, had a pack so you could hold more shells up by the receiver. Uh, it was a Mossberg. I think it was a Model 500A. 500A, and you said it was black as well? Yeah. So black 500A, Mossberg, you said with a scope, is that right? Yep, yeah, single pump. And when you said so we could hold uh, extra shells near the receiver, what part of the gun are we talking about? If you could explain that for the jury, because some members of the jury might not know what, where the receiver um, is. Up above, so it's like uh, where the shells would come out. Okay. And... Uh, when he showed that shotgun to you, did it have any rounds in that area? That yes, it had five in that area. Five. 
And what about the AR-15? Did he show you that right, that weapon as well? I didn't really see the AR-15. I just got to look at it, but I know it was there. Okay. So where did he show these to you? Where were you? In the living room of the Guilford Street address. And how much did he offer to sell the AR-15 for? I can't recall the price of the AR-15. I know I bought the shotgun for two fifty. Okay. Um, you can't recall the price for the AR-15 bought the shot you bought the shotgun yeah so you purchased that from him yeah okay where did that transaction take place in that same same place Guilford Street yeah and did he uh, who else was there when he showed you these guns and offered you these guns uh, Kayla was there and do you know she was in the kitchen she was in the kitchen and when we say Kayla who is Kayla Kayla Montgomery's wife What room were you in when he showed you these guns and you bought the shotgun? The living room. The living room? Did you see where he got the guns in the house before he showed them to you? Uh, he went upstairs, so I'm assuming the bedroom. Okay. So he went upstairs. Did he tell you how he got them? No. Okay. When he... So, um, did he tell you whether they were stolen? No, he said they were hot, which, I mean, obviously I assumed they were stolen. Okay. So when he said hot, is that what made you have that assumption? Yes. Okay. Had you heard that term before, that somebody says something's hot? and that Yeah. Okay. When he showed them to you, how, how were they stored? Were they in a case were they wrapped in something? Did he have nothing on him? He just brought the guns down by hand. Pretty sure they were wrapped up in a blanket. Okay. Do you recall what the blanket looked like? I don't recall. And were they wrapped up together or individually? I honestly can't recall. It was a while ago. Okay. And did you see both guns or just the shotgun before you bought it? I saw both guns that, that day, yeah. Now, at that time... In October of 2019, had you already been convicted of a felony? Yes. Okay. So it was illegal for you to have a gun at that time, correct? Yes. Other than you said Kayla was there when the defendant sold you the shotgun and showed you the other gun, was there anybody else in the home? I think the kids were there too. Um, did you see any other adults in the home? No. Initially, when you um, spoke, well, you did speak to police about this, about the defendant offering you guns and then selling you the shotgun, correct? What's up? You did meet with police before, is that right, and talked about what you're talking about today? Yeah. And when you initially met with them, did you tell them that you had purchased the shotgun? I can't recall. I'm honestly not sure. I, th I think I may have. I may, I mean, I'm, I've met with them so many times, it's hard to honestly keep track of it, but I, I know I told them eventually that I purchased a shotgun from them. And in terms of talking to them about the def Adam Montgomery showing you these two guns and offering these two guns for sale, did you say that each of the times that you met with them? I think so, yeah. When you told the police that Adam Montgomery had sold you that shotgun and showed you those two guns. At that time, did you have a lawyer present with you? What do you say that again? Was there a lawyer that was in the meeting with you when you met with police and you told them about Adam Montgomery showing you these two guns and then selling you the shotgun? No. And when you spoke with them, uh, did you give them permission to look at any of your social media accounts? Yes. Okay. What did you give them permission to look at? My Facebook. In your Facebook account, what was the name that you had for your account? Uh, Kevin O'Leary. Kevin O'Leary. Is it? Did I get that right? Yeah. O'Leary. At the time that you met with police and you told them this information. 
did you have any sort of a deal worked out for any of your criminal charges? No. And uh, it's my understanding that uh, recently you may have reached a plea deal on a different matter, a different felony matter that you're charged with, correct? Yes. And that particular matter does not involve the Attorney General's office, does it? No, no, it doesn't. Sustained. What, what prosecuting agency is doing that, is bringing that charge against you? What do you mean? Which, which prosecuting agency is bringing that charge against you? So which office? Is it uh, a, count, a county attorney's office, a police department, a attorney general's office? Oh, it's not the attorney general's. It's whoever. You know, I mean, I broke the law, so whoever handles that, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. And with regards to that, um, the prosecutor, well, you said already it's not the attorney general's office. Yeah. When, or before you came to testify today, were you made aware that an immunity order has been issued for your testimony here today? Yes. Okay. And that order states, have you seen that order? Have you read that order before? Um, I believe I've read the order, yes. Okay. And with regards to that order, what's your understanding of that order? What does that protect you from? Uh, being charged with anything I've, you know, admitted to today. I want to show you what's been marked States Exhibit 41, identification only. I just want to have you take a look over that for a minute. And take your time and look up whenever you're done. With regards to the immunity order that's been issued here, um, specifically on this, uh, what part of this order um, talks about the protections that you get? In terms of what, are, what is the explanation of protection that you have? I just have protection from immunity, so whatever I say can't be used against me. So I'm admitting that I bought the shotgun or anything like that. From what my understanding is of it, that's why I'm here today. And that's for your testimony today. This immunity order protects you from your testimony today. That's your understanding. Yeah. It doesn't say anything about your previous Thank you. Your Honor, the question is going to be withdrawn. You restate that. Okay. Mr. Lavelle, does it say anything about your previous statements to the police? Yeah. If you want to take a look. Yeah. Sorry, man. It's, it's all right. It's I multiple paragraphs. So it's all right. So what part will I have? I'm just going to direct your attention to the yeah. second paragraph with regards to the order. And the question I'm going to ask you afterwards is whether or not the immunity order says anything about your uh, statements to police, anything before today. No, right? That's all right. Take your time. Take your time. Grab the order back from you. Does mm. that say anything about your statements to police before? No. Right. 
And Mr. LaBelle, while we were talking a moment ago, I think I may have overheard you say correctly that you're dealing with a concussion right now. Is that correct? Yeah, I am. Okay. Does that at all affect your memory of your interactions with Adam Montgomery and him showing you these two guns or selling no, them? No, I, I can clearly remember that I bought the guns off him and everything. I have a concussion, so trying to do everything right now is a little confusing, but yeah. Understandable. Understandable. Thank you for explaining that to me. You're welcome. At any time, did you ever fire that shotgun? Yes. Okay. And when was that? I can't remember the date, but I know I was with him. I was at this place behind uh, Rock Ribbon. It's a bunch of sand dunes. I don't know the exact place for it, where it's called. We fired a single round out of it there. Okay. And you said you were with him. Is him Adam Montgomery? Yes. A few months later, um, what did you do with that shotgun? After you had purchased it and owned it for a while, what did you do with it? I wound up selling it back to him for a gram and a half of crack cocaine. Sold it back to him for a gram. Did you say a gram and a half? Yeah. Okay. And later on, did you see him uh, holding that shotgun after you had sold it back to him at any time? Uh, I believe he got rid of it to someone else. Okay. Did you ever see him carrying around or no. anything like that? We didn't hang out much after that. You stated before that when you bought the shotgun, there were no other adults in the house. That's right? None that you could see. Excuse me. None that right? I could see, but I, I'm pretty sure Kayla was in the kitchen of the house. Right. You did, you did mention Kayla. I apologize. I want to make sure I got your words and your testimony correct. There was Kayla in the house, you said. Um, with regards to the two guns, when they were shown to you and when you purchased the shotgun, you said, I believe, two to 200 or $250? Yes. Is that cash? Yes. Who did you hand that cash to? Him, Adam Montgomery. Right. Is Adam Montgomery seated in the courtroom here today? Yes. Okay. Could you please point out where he's seated and the color of the shirt he's wearing? Blue. Your Honor, if the record could please reflect the witnesses identified the defendant. <laughs> the record shall so reflect. Just a moment, please. Landscaping. And how long, or, or do you remember what company you were working for? I don't remember the company, no. And how long did you work for them? I'm not sure. Off and on, um, I think I was working for Lock London Landscaping at the time. I think I worked for them for like four or five months. But you were working at the time that you bought the shop? Yeah. Thank you. I don't have any further questions for you, and I believe that that stops my record. Okay. Take a second to move my the podium over to my stuff there, and so you can take a deep breath if you want. My name's Caroline Smith, and I have a few questions for you as well. Um, you talked about some things that you couldn't really remember. Yeah. So do you remember uh, what year this event was that you're talking about with the guns? Uh, 2019. And how do you remember that? Because that's the year it happened. Okay. Uh, do you remember what time of year? Um, can't remember the time of the year. I know for certain that I had received and bought the gun off him and then sold it back to him. That I can remember. Do you remember what time of year? Like I said, I can remember buying the gun off him and I can remember selling it back to him. Okay. Do you remember the time of year? Yeah, you've asked that three times now. I said I remember buying the gun off him and selling it back to him. I don't know. 
what's confusing about it. Okay. So I have asked three times and you still haven't answered. Do you remember the time of year? I believe it was September-ish, maybe. Okay. Do you remember the time of day? No. Do you know if it was morning, noon, night? No, it was three years, four years ago. Okay. So do you remember if it was dark out? No. Do you remember if it was in the morning? No. Sustained. Do you go to Mr. Montgomery's house back during that time period in the morning? Uh, usually in the afternoon. Okay. And so um, do you go there at night? Sure. Okay. And on this particular occasion, you don't know if it was afternoon or night? No, I was over there multiple times, so, you know, I hang out with them multiple times every day almost, so it's hard to say what day it was that these guns are rotten. Okay. And uh, I think that you said that you talked to the police multiple times and you told them you purchased the gun from Adam, right? Mm-hmm. Um, actually, when you talked to the police... Uh, at the halfway house, you said that you had gone to Adams and saw them, but that you didn't purchase them. Do you recall that? Uh, maybe, possibly. Okay. I know eventually I told him I bought the guns off him. Okay. So you have a vague recollection of originally denying that you bought any guns off of Adam, but you uh, said that you had seen them, right? I know I bought them off them. I had the shotgun in my house, so I know I bought the shotgun off them for 250 Okay. So I'll slow down my question a bit. My question was, you have a vague recollection of talking to the police, saying that you saw the guns but not bought them, right? I think at first I didn't tell them. I think it was my second meeting with them. I told them I bought the guns. Okay, so on the first meeting, you didn't tell them you bought the guns, right? No. And that meeting was at the halfway house? The first meeting, I believe so. Okay. And the halfway house means that you've gone through your sentence at prison, and this is a step to try and get out of prison and back into the community, right? Correct. And... Um, so let's talk about uh, your convictions. Um, in March of 2013, you had a Class A felony conviction for receiving stolen property, right? Yeah. And in February of 2015, you had a failure to register as a sex offender. Correct. Uh, which means that there were convictions earlier that required you to have to register in 2015, and you didn't. Right. And um, you went to prison for that, right? Yeah. And in 2019... You got a habitual offender charge conviction? Yeah. And they so. actually suspended that sentence and gave you probation, right? I don't know. I've been arrested many times, so it's hard to keep track of what's what. Sure. Okay. Uh, if I showed you a copy of the conviction, you think that might help you? Might. I don't know. I'm going to show you a stapled package of material and give you a chance to look it over, okay?
Okay. And, um, after reviewing that, did it refresh your recollection that you received a conviction for habitual offender with a two and a half to five suspended and two years probation on March 18, 2019? Um, yeah, I think, I believe so. That's what I went to prison for, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, you got a suspended sentence at that time. I mean, I'm not sure, like I said, I have a concussion, so, I mean, words are kind of jumpy on the paper right now, like I said, so, I mean, I can't really read, so I'm just trying to answer your questions as truthfully as I can. What I can remember is that I bought the guns off him, pretty much what it boils down to. Are you confident to testify? Can you read and understand what's in front of you? Oh, I can understand what's going on, I can understand what's going on in the past. And 19. Uh, you got a conviction for a habitual offender. You got a suspended prison sentence with two years probation, right? Sure. Is that correct? Uh, whatever it says in the paper is correct, yeah. So, all right, let me look through it, then, yeah, we'll do it this way. Do you want to be a stickler? So what charge are you referring to? The habitual offender charge. Is that And what page would that be on in here? If you could show me. Sure. So uh, this first page um, says that you are guilty of a felony, right? Yeah. It says date of offense May 8th right there, too. So sure. you're saying March, so obviously that's not going to happen. The date of the conviction is March. Oh. February 17, 2015. Is that when the judge signed off on it? I believe so, yeah. Okay. And the charge that was attached, oops. Did I give you the wrong one? Hmm. Huh. Sorry? Looks like Thank you me. did. completely correct I'm way off there so that I just handed you the failure to register as a sex offender charge yep. right complete wrong form so the March 18 uh, charge let's try that again and do you think that if I walk you through some of the paperwork here it might help you get through it Possibly. Okay, I'm going to show you. You may proceed. The objection is overruled. So I'll get it right this time. I'm going to um, show you a package of material, and it sounds like maybe if I walk you through the right pages, we can probably get through it faster. If it's the right form, yeah. Okay. So on uh, March 18, there is a conviction as a certified habitual offender. Yeah. Is that right? That's right. That's and right that was guilty, and it was a felony. Mm hmm. And. The sentencing sheet shows two and a half to five. Yeah. And that was suspended for three years. Mm hmm. You have to say yes or no. Yes. Okay. And you also got two years of probation starting right away, right? Yep. And so 
So you started on probation on March 18, the day of the sentencing, right? I believe so, yeah. And you never reported to probation, right? No, I was in prison. In March of 2019? Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm, never mind, no. Okay. So, um, in July, Uh, so, so anyway, one of the terms of probation is not to have guns, right? Yeah. Okay. And you didn't actually report to probation, right? I don't believe I had probation. I'm pretty sure it was parole. It was after the prison sentence. Okay. So let's go back to this document that I showed you. I'm going to show you the sentencing sheet again to see if yeah. that refreshes your recollection of whether it was probation or not. Treasures for all. Okay. And so under this, here's that sentencing sheet we were looking at, right? Mm -hmm. And at the top of that sentencing sheet, page two, it says probation for a period of two years forthwith, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. And you got a probation violation on that charge, right? On what charge? The habitual offender that you got a suspended sentence yes. for. Yes. And th that probation violation, uh, you went back to prison when you were picked up on that charge, right? On the habitual offender? Uh-huh. I honestly can't recall. It's okay. It's been it's so long ago. Okay. Well, anyway, in March of 2019, on to uh, throughout 2019, you had not reported to probation, right? I'm not sure. It's, you know, five years ago. Okay. Okay. Um, in July of 2020, you went back to prison uh, in part for the probation violation on the habitual offender, right? I don't know. Can you show me where it says that? If it went back in July? Um, Start with a probation violation. And again, maybe walk you through these documents. That was from July 10 of 2020, right? Mm -hmm. And that's for a violation of probation and par or parole, right? Yep. And the number on that. And for that, you got the two and a half to five years, right? Yeah. So you were back in prison on July 10, 2020, right? Yeah. And that was for a failure to appear after the 318-19 sentencing, that you failed to report to probation afterwards? I believe so. Okay. And so during the summer into the fall, uh, if police found you, they would have arrested you on the violation of probation, right? Assumingly. Okay. Um, Then there was, um, on that duty to report, 
where you had gone to prison for a period of time back in 2015, um, they actually imposed more time for that because of that uh, probation violation, right? Uh, I can't recall, honestly. Okay. Oop, misread it again, sorry. That duty to report, uh, On January 7 of 2021, you got a violation of probation or parole on the, and were sentenced to two to five years in New Hampshire State Prison. Is that right? I, I, at this point, I'd just like to see the form because you showed me the wrong form twice so far. I have to ask the question before I approach you to show you. So. Uh, on January 7, 2021. Yep. Violation of probation or parole. Yep. And the sentencing sheet says two to five years. Yep. Okay, so we saw the. Uh, that sentence is the sentence that two to five years that you were serving when you were spoken to the police at the halfway house, right? Yes. And that is when you spoke to the police at the halfway house but didn't tell them that you had purchased a gun, right? Correct. Because telling them that you had purchased a gun uh, would have uh, been a new crime, right? Potentially. You were a felon at the time, right? Mm -hmm. Say yes or no. Yes. And as a felon, you're not allowed to have a gun. No, you're not. It's correct. And, pardon? I said that's correct. You're not allowed to have a gun being a felon. So purchasing a gun is a new crime, right? Yes. They also didn't ask if I bought a gun. Okay. So. Um, I admitted that to them later on. My second question. I told them my second or third meeting that I purchased a gun. Okay. Um, so, when you are talking to them in March of 2022, they've come to you at the halfway house. Yeah. And they tell you they want to talk about Adam. Yeah. And they tell you they want to talk about some guns. Yeah. And by the way, Kayla was a friend of yours, right? I'd say acquaintance. Okay. She's somebody that you had reached out to um, after you had talked to the police about that stuff, right? Yeah. And um, when the police came to talk to you about Adam, you at the halfway house had the ability to go into the community a bit, right? Yeah. You could work, right? Yeah. And so you start, and you had access to a TV at the halfway house? Mm. Yes. Objection is overruled. So 
You were aware that Adam was arrested back when the police came to talk to you in March 2nd, 2022, right? Uh, I believe so. And I've said March 2nd in 2022. Do you know that that was the date? I don't know when the date was. Do you think if I showed you a report of your conversation with the police that it might refresh your recollection? It might. I don't know the actual date he was arrested. I don't know the actual date the cops even came to talk to me in the halfway office. I just know they came to talk to me. Maybe to pinpoint some things for you. Uh, you were living at the halfway house called Calumet House. Yeah, I was. And that's at 126 Lowell Street in Manchester. Or anyway, it was the Calumet House as it reflects on that report, right? Yeah. And looking at the date of that report, does that help refresh your recollection about March 2nd, 2022? <sighs> I don't know if he was arrested March 2nd, but that, I guess that's when they came to meet with me. That's when they came to meet with you, it was March 2nd, 2022? No. Okay. But you, at the time that they met with you, with him, uh, they met with you, knew that Adam had been arrested at that point, right? Yeah. And you knew that Kayla had been arrested at that point, right? Yeah, most likely. Okay. And, um... When they talked to you, they talked to you about guns, right? Yeah. And they actually told you that they had some information that was pointing to you, right? Not that I'm aware of. They had questions for me. I don't know if they had information that was pointing towards me. Okay, well, the questions were about Adam and some guns, right? Yeah. And you didn't particularly want to talk to them that day, right? No. And one of the ways that they got you to talk to them was to let you know that Section you might. Characterization. Coach? <coughs> And one of the ways that they got you to talk to them was to say they had information that could get you in trouble, right? I didn't say they had information that get me in trouble. They had questions for me. Okay. And, but you didn't want to talk to them at first, right? No, I talked to them. Okay. You said if, before we went up to the judge at the bench that you didn't really want to talk to them when they came, right? I didn't really want to talk to No, no, I don't want to talk to cops in general, but I did. I gave them my fa permission to go through my Facebook. They had questions more about the missing girl, not more of the guns. Okay. So when they talked to you, they said that they were more interested in Adam and the gun and not so interested in you, right? I can't recall. That they were interested in getting you in trouble for the guns, they wanted information from you, right? I can't recall. I guess that's a long time ago. I know they had questions from me. I answered them as truthfully as I could. Okay. So, um, but one of the things that you knew was if you told them that you had a gun, that they could arrest you, right? Uh, yes, possibly. And you're in the halfway house on your way back into the community, and you don't want to be facing another charge, right? Correct. So you talk to the police reluctantly, but am I fair to say reluctantly? What do you mean by reluctantly? You didn't really want to do it, but you sort of, with the... No, I would only talk to them. I could have said, you know, I plead my Fifth Amendment and I'm not talking to you at all, but I did talk to them. Oh, the Fifth Amendment, and that's what you're doing here today, right? You had... 
asserted your Fifth Amendment right today? Is that right? I have immunity for my testimony today. That's why I'm here. Right. And the immunity for your testimony is because you asserted your Fifth Amendment privilege, right? Sure. Am I correct? Maybe. So you knew that being here and admitting to purchasing a gun could get you criminal charges? Potentially. And so before you testified, you needed the promise from the prosecutors that they would not charge you based on the testimony here today, right? I don't understand the question. Do you remember when you were talking about the court order with the prosecutor? And he showed you that piece of paper and had yeah. read? And that court order you read said that you will not be prosecuted for information that you give here in court today, right? Correct. However, it did not say that you couldn't be prosecuted for statements that you gave before today, right? Um, I'd have to see the paper again. Sure. I'm going to show you what's been marked as 41 for ID. Yeah. And I think the prosecutor specifically asked if you knew that it did not protect you from statements that you made before today, right? Yeah. I think so. Okay. So when you told the police, eventually, uh, on one of the other interviews, you did tell the police that you purchased the gun, right? Yeah. And um, that statement can be used to charge you with a criminal offense, right? Yeah. And you don't expect to get charged for being a felon in possession of a gun, though, do you? No. Um, you felt pretty comfortable that they weren't going to charge you, even though you didn't have immunity for those statements, right? I don't know how to answer the question. Uh, my understanding is that as long as my testimony is truthful and honest, is that, you know what I mean? I'm okay. Okay. For so, buying the gun. I understand that, you know, I can't be charged for admitting that I bought the gun. Okay. Why do you understand that to be true? Because that's what it says in the paper. What do you mean? So we just clarified that the paper said your testimony here in court and does not apply to the statements you made to police before court, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't expect the police to charge you for those statements. Um, I don't know. I guess they can. I guess they can if I'm not protected by it. So who knows? But you don't expect it, right? I don't expect it, but it could happen. Okay. And um, it hasn't happened. Date, right? No. But uh, you have gotten another charge that you're back in prison for, right? Yes. And I think that, uh, did I hear on direct that you've resolved that for a lesser offense? Uh, yes. And that was, that's just recent, right? Yeah, it's running with my prison setback. Okay. Pardon? It's running with my prison setback. So you got a prison setback after you left Calumet House, and uh, when you were talking to the police, you got out into the community, and you ended up getting a, a, another uh, in trouble again and going back to prison, right? Yeah. And that's called the parole setback, right? Yes. But you've already also reached an agreement on another charge that you testified about um, that you say will run at the same time as your prison setback? From my understanding. So it's your understanding you won't do any additional time for that new charge? That's a misdemeanor. Okay. Didn't start as a misdemeanor, though, did it? No. Started as a felony, right? No.
Now, we talked about the conversation at Calumet House. The next time that the police talked, and that's when you didn't tell them you had purchased a gun. The next time you talked to police, uh, was on April 28, 2023. Is that right? I don't know the dates. Okay. Not time so <laughs> there is sort of a process that we go through for me to approach you on that. And um, I'm going to approach, would looking at the report help refresh your recollection, do you think? Yeah, if it's the right one. I'm going to show you a copy of a document, and you see your name on that document? Yep. And you see a date on that document? I do. And on April 28, 2023, you were back in the New Hampshire State Prison for Men, right? Yes. Okay. So that was over a month ago, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. And a little over a month ago, um, you told them you didn't want to be recorded, right? Right. And the first one wasn't recorded either, right? Right. And um, you're not in a good situation being back in prison, right? Sure. And you do want to help police out, right? Yep. And so you actually tell them something that will get you in more trouble. Right? Potentially. Because you think it'll help the police with what they are looking for, right? Sure. And they actually gave you some of the information about the investigation that um, made them think that you were holding back before. What do you mean by holding back before? When you hadn't said that you purchased a gun. Well, I told them before that meeting uh, I had. Oh, when? Before 428. Uh-huh. I'm pretty sure they've met with me four or five times, so it's hard to keep track of which date, but on one of them I'm pretty sure I did. Okay. So, um, in any event, talking to the police about a gun that you possessed while you were a felon and while you were on probation, during all that time, nobody brought charges on you, right? No. And you didn't expect anyone to bring any charges on you, right? No. Because you were giving the police what they wanted. No. You were pointing the finger at Adam, right? I suppose. Okay. Okay. And... So, when uh, you say that you purchased the gun from Adam, um, you definitely bought a gun while at Adam's house, right? From him, exactly, yes. Okay. You were at Adam's house. Yeah. The gun was there, right? Yeah. And Adam's house was a place that you hung out sometimes. Yeah. And um, other people hung out sometimes. Yeah. And um, Mike Sullivan was there sometimes? I can't recall. I know we hung out at Mike Sullivan's house. I can't honestly say if Mike Sullivan was there or not. Okay. And some of the people that uh, you also hung out with, uh, did you hang out with Kim Fram? No. Okay. Ishmael Garcia? No. Didn't know him? I don't even know who these people are. Pardon? I don't even know who these people are. When I hung out at Adam's house, I hung out with him and Kayla. Okay. But other people came over there, right? Yeah, but I don't know their names. Okay. I don't know who they are. Okay. Maybe. So, you know what I mean? Most of the time I hung out, it was just me and him. Okay. But there were times that you were there that other people were there, right? Sustained. So we've established then that other people are there when you have hung out and you don't know what their names are, but they were kind of hanging out doing the same thing that you were, right? Sure. And you don't remember a whole lot from that time period, right? No. 
and um, but when you started testifying, um, you were absolutely clear and gave. I was there at Adam's house, and uh, there was an AR-15 that I didn't really look at, and a shotgun that I really did look at, right? I looked at both of them. Okay. And you were very, very clear on that, right? Yeah. That was as clear as a bell, right? Yeah, it's something I wanted. I bought it. That's how I know. It held it in my possession. Okay. And, um, but there's a lot from that time period that you don't remember, right? Yeah. Okay. One of the reasons that you don't remember, well, no. Um, yeah. In One of the things that you said, um, in April to the police was that you sold the gun back to Adam after a couple of months, right? Yeah. How long was it that you had the gun before you say you sold it back to Adam? A couple of months. Maybe two, maybe three. What does that mean? Yeah, I can't be certain. A couple uh, months. Pardon? I can't be certain. A couple months. And um, October 3rd, November 3rd. So, like around early November, uh, early December? I'm not sure. I can't, I can't be certain of when I sold it back. I know I sold it back to him for a gram and a half of crack. Okay. And that may have been, you say, a couple of months later, right? Yeah. And um, a couple of months later would have been early December, right? I'm not sure. A couple of months from early October would be early December. Is that right? Sustained. Okay. Another thing that you said was that when you sold it back to Adam, uh, he took you along to sell it to somebody else. Is that right? Uh, we tried trading it to uh, Mike Sullivan. You said that you and Adam were in a car together, right? I can't. Do you Press. need a break? Yeah, I'd like to see the report again. I show you that report, and I can show you on. It's a three-page report, and I'll say the information that I'm asking about is sort of in the middle on that second page. <coughs> talked about driving over with Adam yeah. to Mike Sullivan's. Yeah. And that um, Adam went inside. Yeah. And and you say that Adam took that gun that you had had for a couple of months and sold back to him, wrapped up in a blanket. Is that right? No. Into Mike Sullivan's. No. And that he stayed there for about 45 minutes. No. Came and back out with he it. 
Pardon? And they came back out with it. Okay. So um, this is what you said in April of this year, right? Yeah. And uh, Mikey, or my, you called him Mikey, right? Yeah. Mike Sullivan was somebody that you had hung out with before, right? Once. Oh, I thought you said that you had... We traded the gun to him or whatever. We tried to trade the gun to him. That's what I'm saying. Is we went over there. I met him one time. That was the only time you met Mike Sullivan? Is that right? Yeah, he might have been in the house or, you know, someone before. I really don't know who he was. It was more of Adam's friend than mine. Okay, I thought that you had said a few minutes ago that you had hung out at Mike Sullivan's, not at, with other people at Mike Sullivan's, not really so much at Adam's. I said I hung out at Adams. If I may have a moment, Mahoney. Yes. So I do want to get this straight. Are you saying that you went to Mikey Sullivan's but didn't go in and that was the only time that you had been there? Um, no, it's not, I don't know. I can't recall, honestly. It's been so long. What I'm saying is I met Mike Sullivan once. Not that time, though. Is that what you're saying? It was a different time that you actually met Mike? Maybe, possibly, I'm not sure. Okay. And I don't really I don't really hang out with his friends, you know what I'm saying? So I hung out with him, that's what I'm saying. So anytime I hung out with Adam, it was me and Adam. You know what I mean? Don't really know any of his friends. I know who Mike Sullivan was because we tried to trade the gun to him. Well, you didn't go in the house, right? No, but I've seen him before. He was in a car one time. With you and Adam? No. I just know that's who we were buying the stuff from. You were buying drugs from Mike? Yeah. At some point? At some point. Okay. So you knew Mike from buying drugs from, and you knew it was his house that you were saying that you were going to with Adam with the gun? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, and let me talk about the immunity that you have here in the um, you could have chosen not to talk to the police in April, right? Sure. Because you had a Fifth Amendment privilege then, too, right? Sure. Do you know that? No, not really. Okay. So, um, you didn't know that you didn't have to talk to the police? No. Certainly didn't know that you didn't have to talk to the police. I wanted to talk to them. I, I offered to talk to them. So okay. when they came in, I didn't hesitate. Okay. But now you're hesitating talking here in court about the crimes, crime that you committed in possessing a gun. Oh, there's no question of that at all. I fucking, I bought the gun. That's point blank period. I bought it off them. Okay. Okay. And you... recently resolved a felony to a misdemeanor to get no additional time. Is that yeah, right? we've been over this, yeah. Thank you. Yes?
All right, ladies and gentlemen, the parties have agreed to a stipulation. That stipulation is that the last conviction that was referred to with regard to this witness was prosecuted by the Office of the Hillsborough County Attorney. Okay, so the stipulation is that the last conviction that was referred to was prosecuted by the Office of the Hillsborough County Attorney. You may proceed. Yeah. <clears throat> Say it again. That's not the same as the Department of Justice. No, I don't believe so. And a few months ago, Attorney Smith asked you in the statement that you're giving police what they want. With regards to you sit, agreeing to sit down and speak with police, on that, do you feel like you were giving them what they wanted? What no, I was just giving the information I had. So you didn't make up this information for them? No. Last question that I have for you is with regards to you being here today. You were subpoenaed to be here, correct? Yes. Right. So you didn't have a choice to be here today? No. And with regards to that, on this, you're currently at the New Hampshire State Prison? Yes. Right. What unit are you out there? Uh, right now, PC. Okay. And explain for the jury what PC is. Uh, protective custody. And when were you placed in the after I was subpoenaed. Sustained. Approach. Sustained. You may uh, restate the question. Rephrase, excuse me, rephrase the question. Thank you. 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 County attorney that reached your deal, not these prosecutors here, right? Right. But it was the Manchester Police Department that was involved in talking to you about Mr. Montgomery, right? We'll say that again. It was the Manchester Police Department that talked to you about Mr. Montgomery. Right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. We'd ask this witness to please be excused from the subpoena, sir. Any objection? Yes. Uh, no. <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. Uh, all right. I'm going to have you stay right there for just a moment, Mr. Yeah. Bell. Uh, it's 10.30, just about, so this is a good time for our mid-morning break. So we'll take 15 minutes. I'll see you back here at 20 of. You may remain seated. Right. Everyone else, please rise for the jurors. Mr. LaBelle, you can step down. Uh, you are excused.
screws. Yeah. All right, everybody, we're going to take a break. Um, so let me just let the sheriff's office do their thing here. I did hear from uh, from the clerk. Why don't, why don't I just ask the clerk to? We, we sounds like we're all set for Monday at. Attorney Shep is available Monday the fifteenth. I'm just confirming. Attorney Shepard's available at least. I did inquire about the status of his client, but I haven't heard back. Thank you. All right, everybody. Uh, we'll start up again at 20 of. Thank you. And I guess I just should ask.
That's okay. I just didn't want him to start without you. Go ahead. Yes. have the witness ready in the courtroom. Thank you. And then whenever we're ready, we'll... Right. Are we ready to bring in the jurors, everybody? the jury. Please be seated. State may call its next witness. Okay, and before we get started, there's a microphone right in front of you. Okay. Okay, and so if you could just pull that a little closer to you. Okay, so you might want to get a little closer to it. I just want to make sure that we're making a clear record. Everything's being recorded. Um, can you start by saying your first and last name and spelling it for the record? Uh, Michael Sullivan, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N. And um, how old are you, Mr. Sullivan? 42. Where do you currently live? Uh, in East Hampton, Massachusetts. And who do you live there with? My wife. Any children? Five. And uh, prior to living in East Hampton, Massachusetts, Mass, 
prior to living in East Hampton, Mass, where did you live? Um, Manchester, 620 Somerville Street. Um, did you receive a subpoena to be here today? Yes. Would you have been here without a subpoena? Yes. You mentioned that you lived in Manchester on Somerville Street? Yes. How long were you there? Um, I want to say three years, three and a half years. And when you lived there, who were you living there with? My wife and kids. I want to turn your attention to late 2019. Were you living back on Somerville Street in, Ma in Manchester back on, yes. in late 2019? And where were you in life at that point in time? Um, well, um, just prior to that, I had, um, I was living uh, on another part in Manchester and I was doing construction and I started taking pills, Percocet. And then um, after that, I just became an addict. I started doing like heroin and then I would do cocaine and, you know, I just became an addict. Same time, like, you know, like um, it's like looking back on it now, you know, it's like a, it, it's like a lifestyle, you know, it's like, you know, you get so wrapped up in it that like you don't understand that it, it, it revolves everything you do in, you know, in your life at the time, you know. Do you remember around when that addiction started? Um, right before I had moved to Somerville. So, you know, I, I think I was uh, 37, 38. What year would that have been around? Um, 15, maybe, 2015. 16, somewhere in there. Your wife? You mentioned you lived with her in Somerville Street. Yeah. Was she aware of this addiction? Uh, not for a long time, you know. Not for a long time. Because she's never done, like, any drugs or even smoked or drank or, you know, anything like that. So, um, like, after I, like, you know, it, it gets to the point where you think you're hiding it from everybody, but really, like, everybody knows, and you're kind of just lying to yourself. So, um like once my wife confronted me about it, you say you're gonna fix it, you lie, you lie, you lie, you know. Usually it takes you hitting like rock bottom. What happened to me, you know? When was rock bottom for you? Um, I had gotten in trouble. Um, you know, like I was I had I was worried about losing my kids, you know, and my wife was taking the kids and leaving and, you know, she got tired of uh, broken promises and was going to just take my kids and leave. And was that around January of 2020? Yeah. The objection is sustained. I'll let the answer stand, but uh, caution the state. No leading questions, please. Do you remember when you hit rock bottom? Uh, it was <laughs> early 2020. Prior to that, what was your drug of choice? It started with Percocet and then it went to heroin or fentanyl, either or, you know. Heroin or fentanyl? Yeah. Are you sober now? Yeah. How 18, long? 18 months. 18 months sober? I went to a, a facility and then I, uh, I also go now daily to, um, you know, a place in Mass where I get treatment and I do meetings still, so. And I think you said earlier it took you getting into trouble <clears throat> to get sober. Getting into trouble, but it was more like, you know, uh, like getting sick, you know, and then, like, I, I don't think you really think about yourself as much because you're destroying yourself, but, like, at some point you kind of open your eyes and see everybody around you and realize you're, like, destroying them too, you know? I noticed you just looked down when you said that. Is this something, this period in your life, is it something that you're proud of? No. So back to late 2019, did you have a circle of friends? I did. I, did. Um, uh, I had like a big house, you know, so like my house was like probably half of this place, the bottom, my cellar, and uh, 
it was huge. So I kind of just had like a revolving door because, you know, like um, when you're like, you justify everything you do. And then when you like start doing drugs, you're like, um, you know, you get sick, you get really sick if you don't have them, you know? And, uh, and I mean, you get hot flashes, you sweat, you shake, you can't control your bowels, you, you don't sleep, you know, and you have agonizing pain, you know? So for like a lot of people, you know, it, not that it's an excuse, but like s some people are addicts and they get to the point where they just don't want to get sick, you know? Like people, people do get high, but you know, like you, the, the thing you really don't want to have happen is to get sick, you know? And um, so I would have everybody at my house, you know? And then like, I guess like you think they're your friends and I guess you think you're being their friend because like I would give them drugs, they would give me drugs and like, you know, like I wasn't being a good friend then, but so like, you mentioned you, you, know, you tell yourself that. You had a lot of people that you would trade with and they thought, you guys thought you were friends. Who, who were those people? Back um, in I, I had a lot. I had, you know, I had Adam, I had uh, Ish, Kimmy, um, Amber. You know, I, mean, I could I could name fifty people. <clears throat> you mentioned someone named Ish. Mm -hmm. Do you know the full name of that person? Ishmael Garcia. And how long did you know Ishmael Garcia for? Um, I knew Ish. He was the person that I um, had met in Beach Hill. He's the person that I got started doing it. And so you had a drug connection with him? Yeah. You mentioned Kimmy. Do you know her name, her full name? Kimmy, like, Kimmy is like a, she's like a really good person. And she's one of those people that, like, you know, you meet some people you see, like, that are doing drugs, you know, they're easy to... Sustained. So, Mr. Sullivan, my question was, do you know what Kimmy's full name is? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Kimberly Frayne, I think. And how did you know her? Uh, like I said, she was like, you know, I had met her from... Um, like she had called when her car went missing and um she would come over all the time but like she, Kimmy was just someone who like you know you you uh an easy target you know like an easy target to sustained your honor I'd request permission to lead uh approach That's how long I knew her for. Earlier you said soft target. What does that mean? Approach.
Mr. Sullivan, you also mentioned Adam. Who is Adam? Adam is sitting at the defendant table. He was somebody who, um, he was another person who came over the house. You know, we would did drugs, gave each other drugs, you know, same thing, just an addict knowing an addict. And how'd you meet Adam? Um, Manny had come over and we were hanging out and we all did drugs in the bathroom, you know. So you just mentioned someone named Manny. Do you know Manny's, is Manny a nickname? Yeah. Do you know his real name? Uh, well, I think it's Hector okay. Ayala, I think, or something. Um, back to the defendant. So you, you met him through Manny. Yeah. And how long did you know him for? About the, um, well, probably about maybe 16 months, somewhere in there, you know, I don't know, maybe in the same time frame as Kimmy, you know, it was all, it was kind of the same group. And and so there was a drug connection with yeah. the defendant? <clears throat> Do you know what his drug of choice was back then? Uh, crack. How and, I and, and like he, he would get sick if he didn't have, you know, heroin too. How often would you see the defendant? Um, I mean, once he started coming over, it was like, you know, everybody kind of came over daily, you know, it was, it was, uh, like I, I let my house become a drug house, you know. Your house became a drug house? Did you ever go to the defendant's house? Once. And do you remember where he lived? Um, on the west side, I don't, I don't know the name. I just know how to get there. You know, you go over the bridge to the west side. You go past, like, the Applebee's and that plaza on your left and take a left up the hill. And this house, his street is on, a, on the right, about are, midway down. Are we talking about here in Manchester? Yeah. <clears throat> um, do you remember who he was living with at the time? Uh, his girl and his kid. Do you remember his girl's name? Uh, um, she worked at Duncan's. I know. I think it's like Kay Kayla or something like. So you don't remember her name? I'm not sure. Yeah. That's fine. Did you ever do drugs with her? One time. And was that at your home? Or that was at their home. Their home. Besides that one time that you did drugs with her, did you see her more than that? I mean, uh, only like if, you know, he was stopping by with her or something like that, but it didn't really like, you know, I never I spoke with her, you know, or like, you know, it was just that one time that we spoke at the house. So again, I want to focus on late 2019. Uh, back in late 2019, did you become aware of an incident involving stolen guns? Yeah. And can you tell us about that? So, um, like I said, you know, um, like if, if you know people um, that aren't used to like, you know, aren't like, are beginner drug addicts, then a lot of times you can like borrow their car or because they're just starting out. So I'm going to stop you there, Mr. Sullivan. Um, at some point you became aware of stolen guns. Yeah. Do you know whose guns were stolen? Kimberly and Chris's. And those are the frames? Yes. <clears throat> at some point after learning about that, uh, did you have a conversation with the defendant? Yes. Tell me about that conversation. Well, we were at, we were at, at first it wasn't with him, like we were at um, my house and like, so I'm not having it, <laughs> just. So I wanna focus on the, the conversation you had with the defendant, not yep. with others. So there was a conversation that was had at my house and then when we were driving, you know, we, we, we were getting high and he didn't, 
have any drugs, so I was giving him drugs. And then he was saying that his girl was going to be sick, so I gave him some more. And then he did that too. So I said, hey, like, I'll give you some more, but let's go to your house so I can make sure that she gets it so she doesn't get sick. And he was like, all right. And we had a, there was a conversation that happened at my house. And on the way over there, we, um, we spoke about that the conversation that just happened at my house is about Kimberly having cameras. And Adam said, uh, I know she's, she's lying about the cameras, you know? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I know she's lying about the cameras. He's like, because I'd already be in jail, you know? Okay, so let's back up. There was a conversation at your house, and who was present for that conversation? I mean, at, there could have been 12 people there at the time, but I know it was me, Kimmy, and Adam because uh, Kimmy had, like, tried to say something to his girl, like, that, you know, like, I didn't know at the time if she was or wasn't, but, like, had said, I have cameras, and, and you know, I guess his girl like got upset or like. And so were you? Could you, can we approach for a moment? So, Mr. Sullivan, there was a conversation at your house. Uh, Sorry, was there a conversation at your house? Yes. And Kim Frayne was there for that? Yes. And the defendant was there for that? Yes. And obviously you were there for that? Yes. Did cameras come up in that conversation? Yes. You leave your house right after that? Well, actually, we, me and him, we had gone and started getting high, and then after he had, I had given him stuff and then I gave him stuff for his girl he did that and then that's how we ended up going to his house because I said hey I'll give it to her you know not that I was like doing a good thing at the time I just want to unpack that and then we'll move on from there um, and so before we do if, if you didn't hear something yourself okay or unless I specifically ask so I, I just want to hurt uh, I just want to ask about what you heard and, okay. and what you saw okay um, <clears throat> so you and the defendant were doing drugs, mm -hmm. and he said he needed some for his girl. Yes. He said she was drug sick. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so you gave him. Did you give him stuff for? Yes. Okay. And he ended up doing that as well. Yes. And what had you given him? Heroin. All right. And so did you have a concern at that point? Well, the whole. You know, like, at the beginning, he had said his wife was sick. And, like, not that, like, you're a good person for giving anybody anything, but, like, if you've been sick, you don't want anyone to get sick. So, like, I didn't, I was like, you know, and, and as awful as it sounds, like, when you're doing it, like, if you get sick, then, uh, you know, you're, everything is shutting down. You're like, you know, 
you're sweating, shaking, your stomach hurts, you're, you know, you can't control your bowels, you're... So was your, was your goal to And what happens is if you take just a little bit, it all fixes. Everything, like, within moments, you're, like, back to normal, you know, just with a little bit. So I was going to go over there and, and just give her a little bit. And you wanted to make sure... She, she wasn't it. sick, but I'm not like I wasn't doing her any favors by giving her any. I'm just saying that that's what I did, you know. Your goal was to make sure she got it. Yeah. Okay. So did you leave at some point with the defendant? Yes. And how did you leave? In his vehicle. Sorry. Did you in say his vehicle. in his vehicle? And was there a conversation in his vehicle? Yes. And can you tell me what the substance of that conversation was? <laughs> we were was? having the conversation downstairs with, between him and Kimmy that I overheard then when we got in the car he was laughing because he was like she's bullshitting I know she don't have cameras you know he's like because if she had cameras I'd be in jail already talking about because she was saying that she had cameras the night that her gun got stolen guns got stolen okay and what's your understanding of the guns that were stolen I like so from all the people like my understanding is that she had given handguns like she said that um, I don't know if she said they got stolen or not I just know that she had given handguns to like Manny and Ish you know and then that her uh, assault rifle was stolen alright um <laughs> So we're back in the car with the defendant. Mm -hmm. Where did you go from there? To his house. And was there another conversation with him at his house? Um, when we walked in, you know, he um, he had told his his wife who I was, and then what had just happened, and then she started telling me how much she disliked. Sustained. So I don't want to hear what what Kayla told okay. you. Or his, his girl, sorry, told, okay. told you. Um, I want to hear what he told you. He just, uh, when we were on our way over there, he didn't really say much. He knew why we were going over there. And then after we had that conversation, when we got there, he, like, was introducing me to his girl, you know? Okay. And did the subject of the cameras come up when you got to the yes. to his house? Yes. He did told. he say anything in response to that? No, he, they, she started talking about how much she didn't like, okay. Sustained. He, he went, during, when we started discussing the conversation we just had at my house, he was going into the back room to get the works, or like, if you're getting needles, you know, and, and stuff, and, cause, and then, when he was going in the back room, he said, I, you know, like we were talking about that conversation we had, and then he said, I got it right back here. He's like, I got it in the back room, <laughs> you know? Okay, and at some point during that conversation, did you see the firearms? No. At any point after you found out about the theft of the firearms, did you see them? Yeah. Yes. When was the, f was this one time, multiple times? Um, the time that he, he he came over to my house, and then I actually didn't have, like, he had come over, and I think he thought, like, he was going to be able to trade it. I don't know what he thought, but he came over and got out of it. Sorry, his Mr. Sullivan, my question was, did you see the guns one time or multiple times? I saw the... Uh, Assault rifle once. Okay. Was there another um, fi firearm in the case that you saw? I believe he brought, uh, um, like, I don't know. I don't know where I say that because I'm not. But I believe he brought a shotgun over and had, he wasn't, he just had it and was showing everybody. But I'm not. When you know, say he brought it over, over where? To my home. So you mentioned an assault rifle, and you mentioned the shotgun. Did you see those 
rifles or those firearms at the same time or no. were those separate times? Separate times. The, like, I knew that it was because, the, like, from what I recall, you know, there was four bullets, like, on the side of, like, the shotgun. That's why I knew it was, like, the shotgun. And then when I saw the rifle, like, he had gotten it out of, a, out of the car, and there was, like, a, a sheet over it. But he had the stock and the barrel sticking out, and he was walking up to my house. And I said, no, 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 you can't, you know, because, like, it was broad day, and he looked like Rambo coming up, the, you know, up the driveway with, like, just a little sheet over it, you know? At any point, did the defendant offer you the, the firearms for sale? When that day that he had come over, you know, um, he was talking to me about this, if I wanted it, and I said, I don't even have, I'm like, I'm going to get sick soon. I don't, like, I rarely didn't have drugs, so, like, I said I I didn't have any, and he was like, you know, when he had asked me if I wanted it, and he's like, that's all right. He's like, I can get rid of this, you know, and he's like, I can, he had a, a buddy that he could get rid of it to. Okay. And so the conversation that you're describing right now, you said you didn't have any, any, any what? Heroin. Is that what he was offering the gun to you for? That's what he wanted to trade. He wanted to trade for anything if I had, you know, coke or heroin or anything, you know. But I didn't have nothing. So he tells you, it's okay, I can get rid of it. Yeah. And this is at your house? Yeah. What happened next? So I tell him, he, he, he like, talks to somebody and he says, hey, I got a guy that's coming over and he's going to pull up and I'm going to give it to him. And I said, move your car out of my driveway. I had a big parking lot next to my house. And I said, will you, will you go into the parking lot and not in my driveway? So he went out and he, it's really like there's a fence and here's my door. And like maybe from me to you is, is where he parked, but it was out of my driveway. Okay, so he moves his vehicle. Yeah. And that's after telling you that he has someone that's coming? Yeah. Was your, what was your understanding of what that person was coming to do? He was getting rid of the gun. And which gun are we talking about on this occasion? The uh, the uh, the assault like the the assault rifle like I'm, I say assault rifle like I don't know how they go but I know it wasn't like the you know um, hunting deer rifle you know it was like a you know like a stock and like a an assault rifle I don't know. <clears throat> did you see what he did with that? rifle that you just described oh yeah like like uh you know i was like as awful as it is like i was glad that he was doing what he was doing because like i didn't have any drugs so then he's like mike he's like come with me he's gonna give me money and stuff for it and i said all right so when he showed up we both went into the parking lot and i got in the back seat and you know, after he got hit the gun, he was in the front seat. And when you say he was in the front seat, who's he? Adam. Okay. And then um, you mentioned he said, come with me? The defendant said, come with me? Well, he wasn't saying come with me. He knew, like, I was not feeling well. So it was more like a, uh, I was, like, Right when you get it, will you give me some, you know, like, like so I can feel better type thing? So it sounds like you were sick at that point. Was that, were you, would you call it dope sick? So you were in pain? Yeah. And he says, come with me. Did you go somewhere with him? But you should just go through the pain, you know. <laughs> okay, did you go somewhere with him? Yeah, I went to the car. And we've talked about this. You regret a lot of the decisions you made back then. And you're not that person anymore. Right. Sustain. So you went somewhere with him? Got in the car. Okay. Did the car leave the area? Nope. We sat right there. He said, here. He said, here. I gave money. And Adam reached back, gave me stuff so I could take some real quick. I get back to him, and we left. 
And you said he was gonna. He told you he was gonna get money and stuff. Yeah. What, what, it's, what does stuff mean? Heroin. <clears throat> At any point, did you did you hold either firearm? No. Do you remember being arrested on January 14th of 2020? Yeah. And do you remember uh, providing a statement to law enforcement? Uh, honestly, like, I don't, just like with the, you know, like, the movies you guys gave me and stuff, I didn't, I don't want to look at any of that stuff. I look like, you know, I'm like 110 pounds. I really don't, I didn't want to do any of it. <laughs> do you remember Let's providing? be honest, you know. Do you remember providing a statement back in January of 2020? I'm sure I did, yeah. Do you remember being asked if you saw the guns? I'm sure they asked me that. I, I mean, like, I know that, I'm just telling you, like, I, I know that. Do you remember being asked if you I know saw the I guns? Know. <laughs> huh? Do you remember being asked if you saw the guns? I'm sure they asked me that, you know. Do you remember saying, I held them, I held the AR and the shotgun? I don't remember saying it. The shotgun, like, I, that night I might have held it when he had the, the gun with the four bullets because I remember it was like a big deal at the house, but I don't remember holding them. I might have, you know. Wasn't really too much I wouldn't have done at the time. So, Mr. Sullivan, obviously a lot of time has passed since the events that you're describing. Do you think that your memory of those incidents is better back then or now? Uh, I think I just have, like, um, like certain things that I remember 100% clear, you know? There's certain things, I'm sorry, there's certain things you remember 100% clear. Yeah, and I'm trying to like only say them, you know, like that's what I was trying to say about like, you know, the, the, the shotgun thing. Like, I believe, I thought I remembered him coming over, but I can't say that 100% true. I don't know that it was like him with it or, but I believe it was at the house and we were all there. So like, it's disingenuous for me to say like, it was definitely him with it, you know? I know for a fact about the, you know, like, so I'm saying, like, the uh, the assault rifle and us getting in the car and doing all that, like, you know. Okay. Um, and so that. your relationship with the defendant back then, did you know his first and last name? No. I knew his first name. And what did you believe his last name was? I didn't know. I didn't care. So when you gave uh, your statement in 2020, did you know the defendant's last name at that point? Mm, I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know when I. Oh, uh, he he t he told me in a conversation once. Okay. When you gave your statement in 2020, did you know his last name? I'm not sure. You know, I don't know if I said his last name or not. I don't know. Like this is like that. And that's I, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> Have any other questions for you? Um, the defense attorneys may. Good morning, Mr. Sullivan. How are you? Good. Do you remember me? Yes. I'll introduce myself again. I'm Caroline Smith. How are you? Good. Nice to see you, Caroline.
said something uh, when you were talking about uh, with the prosecutor about the January 2020 interview and seeing a movie on it. You talking about a video? I don't know. You talk, I don't know. Okay. All right. So let's go back. That January 20, 2020 interview. Did you re-look at it or anything? No, I haven't looked at anything. Even the stuff like they gave me for today, I didn't. I didn't look at them either. They gave me DVDs to be able to review, and I don't want to see what I look like. I don't want to see what I sound like. I don't want to be here today. Right. You know. Right. Um, but at the same time, you said that uh, if they hadn't subpoenaed you, you would be. I would. Okay. So. Um, like I'm trying to not be. It's, it's, Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yep. I know you've answered and. Yep. You do talk a lot, right? Sorry. No, I'm asking now. You, you have a tendency to talk a lot, right? Objection, Judge. Overruled. I mean, do I talk a lot? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> do you, like, I, I converse. I usually am talking to somebody, so. <laughs> um, let's talk about how long uh, you I'll try and keep them short and sweet. <laughs> um, just, oh, we only ask the answer the question, yeah. okay? Yep. Um, you knew Adam, let's see, when, you recall when Kimmy talked about a uh, stolen gun, right? Remember the time period? Yes. When? Do I remember the time period of when it happened? Uh -huh. Um. No. no, I just know that we were all at my house. It was the same time in my life, yeah. Okay, so you don't know when it happened, but you do recall it happening and Kimmy talking about going on. I know that Kimmy said that uh, Ish and Manny had taken her car and Adam had come over. She, right. she called and said that they took her car. And I said, I don't, I know that, that when I first, when I got talked to Kimmy first, she said, because uh, she knew kind of we all hung out together. And um, she said, Ish, and Manny wouldn't give her her car back. And I think that you said that that is actually when you first really met Kim, right? Yeah. And you kind of helped her out there. Right? Yeah. But she said, uh, you know, if you let them know their, that you know their last names, yeah. they'll bring it back, right? Yeah. Because you knew their names, yes. right? And um, Ish had actually been a friend of yours for many years. I mean, he was like a friend of mine. Like, then I would have said yes, but now he was the guy who I got drugs from, you know. That's how I met him. That's the only way I knew him, you know. So I wasn't a good friend to other people I gave drugs to, so I wouldn't call him my friend. No, I met him always drugs. Okay. You know, we, we, we hung out and we did things like watch football and did drugs together. We walked and talked and did drugs together. Like, Ish is a, a good person, too. Everybody's a good person. I'm just saying that, like, you know, you know now, knowing what I know, I'm not a good person for, like, giving him drugs while we were hanging out, you know? Okay. In any event, you knew Ish for a few years. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And um, Ish would come over to your house. Yes, and both I ways. Think you were just saying both that, ways. Yeah. Pardon? Both. I went to his house too. Yeah. Okay. You go to his house. He'd go to your house. Is that right? Yes. People would pop in at your house all the time. Yes. And at one point, Kimmy had called you, even though you didn't know her, to get some help getting her car back from Ish and Manny. Yeah, I had. I had, you know, Matt and they, they worked with Matt and uh, Alana, I believe it was, at Dunkin' Donuts, and like Matt and Alana were at my house all the time too. So like they, they were getting phone calls from her. Okay, so uh, you do kind of help her out and, and after that she starts hanging out at your place along with the others, right? Yes. And you said um, 
before that uh, Kim had come over and accused Ish and Mandy of having stolen her gun. Right? Yes. And then you turned around and you wanted to be nice to Kim, so you went and had a conversation with Ish. Right? Yes. And based on that... Yes? So, um, after uh, you helping her with getting her car back, um, she started coming over to your place, right? Yes. And one time she came over to your place and said that Ish and Manny had stolen her gun. Yes. And when she told you that, you went and talked to Ish. Yes. And based on that conversation with Ish, you went and talked to Kim. Yes. And uh, Kim no longer accused Ish no. after that. No. Okay. But she accused everybody else, right? She just said that they that she had not they hadn't taken it that that was part of like their deal that weekend to get more drugs and they were, to use the car and then like you know it was just a deal she had made. Okay. So before I ask more about. Um, some of the things that you said before. Let's talk about the various times that you've talked to law enforcement and prosecutors. About okay. This, okay. Mm -hmm. So the state um, talked about an interview with police January of 2020, right? I don't, I don't remember it, like the date, and, but I did, yes. Okay. And, and you said yes when I was asking you about that, right? Yes. And this was a time that uh, you were driving and were pulled over, right? Yes. And um, you could have gotten in criminal trouble for... I did get in trouble. Okay. And one of the things was that you weren't allowed to drive, right? I got in trouble for driving without a license. <laughs> Weren't you a habitual offender? Uh, I don't know. I got. I know that that had been like my third, fourth time driving without a license. So. <laughs> okay. So you don't recall if it was the big one. The I don't know. Offender. From that, I had got told to go to rehab for a month, and it would go away. Okay. So let's talk about that. Is um, the other thing that was that there were drugs in the car, right? Yes. And so you talked to the police, right? And um, this is, uh, you were pretty scared when you talked to the police, right? Um, no, I wasn't comfortable, that's for sure. Because <laughs> they actually threatened you to uh, take your kids away, right? They told me they would, yes. They, they said, said, pardon? Yes. They said that um, uh, we'll call DCYS and we'll take your kids away. They told me they were going to. They said it was done. They were like, you know, let me know what's up because I'm, they're like, we're, we're, you've lost your kids. You've lost your kids. And then, you know, they kept saying, like, you lost your kids. And then when we get in the room, they were like, you know, w listen, we can take your kids away. We can take your kids away, you know. And, and uh, I just thought it was a little much. Okay. And so... Um they wanted you to give something to not, um, so that you could get out of trouble. They wanted to know, uh, if you look at that, I had 
a small amount of drugs on my side driving, right? And the person in the passenger seat threw a large amount of drugs in the car. They wanted to know whose drugs those were. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Me either. And they wanted to talk to you about things that you knew in your community that you could give them, and in exchange, um, you understood that you could go to rehab and your troubles would be behind you. No, when, when I went to go to court that day, my lawyer actually said, Mike, you don't have to agree to anything. I can go talk to the prosecutor, and he just said that you can... Go to, I worked it out where you can go to rehab for a month. So there was no, like, uh, no agreement to anything, you know? Just like with here, like, after I had given them the information, why I said I would show up without no subpoena is because I said something after. Let's go back to the 20th, uh, to 2020. Okay. No, I didn't leave town. I didn't want to stay in town <laughs> and go to rehab because okay. the rehab was in town. So you gave information and then got worried that the person that you gave information on would read it in their discovery and know that you had given the information, so you kind of went in hiding. Yeah, well, no, just like in my, all our circle of friends all came to my house every day. So eventually, like, in his discovery, he would see that, and then everybody at the house would ask me about it. I wasn't, you know, I mean, I, I did what I did, so, you know, I, I wasn't going to sit there and say no, but at the same time, I didn't want everybody at my house to, you know, and at that time I was doing drugs, so I didn't want, like, my drug world to fall apart. <laughs> okay. So you were not afraid of that other person that you had given information Oh, no, I was worried about it. I was definitely worried about it, you know. All right. And um, uh, other information that you gave, because you sort of gave a whole lot of stuff, right? No, I, I like, uh, I told him about that one thing, and I, I told him about things that, like, um, like I said, I'm, I'm not trying to like sit on like a high horse, but I, would, I told them about things I wanted to tell them anyway. Okay. So they didn't like make me tell them anything. Like I gave them that information, you know? But they had told you that they were taking your kids away and calling you to the right. Yeah, about the stuff in the car that I didn't know whose it was. Okay. So I couldn't say because I didn't see what had happened. Two people were saying two different things about what happened in the car. So one of the uh, bits of information that you did give them on the 20th was about the Fran guns, right? Uh, I don't know if that was on the 20th, but I did end up giving, it that, giving them that, yeah. It was around, shortly after you were pulled over with the drugs in the car, right? I'm not sure if it was then or when they, or when they got me on the... Um, on the um, um, warrant, like when they when they came and got me at the house. Okay. Um, well, back in, on the twentieth, you gave information that Ish, Manny, and Adam. Right. You said that Ish and first of all, you let the police know that you had information on stolen drugs from Kim and Chris Frame's house. No. You didn't. No, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know anything about stolen drugs. Did I say drugs or guns? Drugs. Uh, my, my mistake. So, uh, you gave police information about, uh, that you said you could give information about stolen guns from Chris and Fran, uh, Chris and Kim Frame's house. Yes. And you told them where Kim and Chris Frame lived. I assume so. And you told them that Ish, Manny, and then you said, and Adam stole the gun. 
I don't know if that's what I said. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I haven't. I did. I did tell him about it. So I. I don't know what I said. Like I said, I haven't reviewed or looked at anything. I said I will. I don't know. I don't, I don't remember saying that. Okay. And you also told them that you held them at Adam's house. I never saw it at Adam's house. And you also told them when they asked where you got the information about what happened to the guns, you said you got it from Ish. Do you remember that? I don't remember any of it. So if you want to, like, like I'll go over my thing with you if you want, but I don't yeah. recall any of that. So we'll go over some other things as well. And I said that I was going to set the stage. There was a conversation with the police back in January-ish of 2020. And then um, in May, March of 2022, uh, you understood that the police wanted to talk to you. Right? Yes. Uh, you had spoken to your wife and you understood the police wanted to talk to you. Yes. And at that time, you were in Manchester. No. When you got the call from your wife. Oh, yes. Okay. Russell. No, no, no. I wasn't in Manchester. I was, like, I was in route. So I guess, I mean, I was, I, I, when I first talked to her, I was driving there. And then when I got there, we talked more about it. So, yeah. Okay. Staying at Beach Street? Beach Hill, yes. I was picking up my son. Huh? I was picking up my son. Okay. So um, the next, after you understood from your wife that the police wanted to talk to you, uh, the police showed up in the morning with to arrest you, right? They said, uh, just have Mike come down. So I spent the night. And instead of leaving my son, I spent the night at... Um, Mike's house and then I was <laughs> supposed to go in the morning but um, it was probably like I don't know really early in the morning and all of a sudden it was like in the movies where like people were held down on ropes and like jump you know like everybody came in and they you know it was the US Marshals okay. Bunch of police too. oh yeah kind of a scary situation right yeah it was too much and that was in March I don't know. Uh, I believe you. Okay, I'm going to give you a copy of um, a transcript of that interview to see if the um, date might refresh your recollection, okay? Okay. So this is an interview with Michael Sullivan. That would be you? March 31st, 2022. Okay. Does that sound right? Yes. And um, they came, they arrested you, they brought you to the police department. Mm -hmm. um, and the arrest was for a fugitive from justice, right? It was for the same charge, but when I didn't go to rehab. It was for a fugitive from justice for not going to court when you were supposed to on the charge. For not going to rehab. I got a fugitive of justice for not going. If I had gone to rehab, that would have all gone away. I never went to rehab. They issued that warrant, and they came and got me. So are you saying you didn't miss court on that? I didn't go to the rehab that I was supposed to go to after that. So That's what I was saying. So supposed to go to court on those charges after that, right? No, my lawyer had made it so that if I went to rehab, then those would go away. Okay. Well, that was the drug charge from January of 2020, right? I believe so. You had an outstanding warrant at the time that you were arrested in January of 2020 for September 2020, uh, 2019. I don't know. Well, you had a felony drug charge, right? Uh, I don't think I had a felony drug charge. Maybe. I, yes, I assume, I assume that, it, yes, you know. I don't know what my charges were. I know that right 
and uh, my lawyer came to me and said, hey, I talked to the prosecutor. I'm like, go to rehab. When you leave this court house, go to rehab right now from here, go there. And I walked out and went home. Yeah. And you still had your earlier charges from September of 2019. I don't know. I don't know if that was part of, like, I assumed that was part of that because I thought all my stuff was done if I had gone that day. I don't know. So you didn't go that day, so there's no reason no, to No, I still, I went and did drugs. And there were more court hearings that you didn't go to. No, after that, they got me. After that, they came in, like G.I. Joe, through the windows and stuff. Like, they came in and grabbed me and scooped me up and brought me to the... To the Two years later, right? In March of 2022. Yeah, well, they had come out to my house to talk to me about... the thing that we, that we can't talk about, right? Your wife called and said that they were looking for you, right? They, yeah, but they came out and said they wanted to talk to me about something. Don't worry, you're not in trouble. Okay. And that was at your wife's place in Mass, right? Yes. But you were here in Manchester. And I said, yeah. And I'm like, all right. I So my wife was like, hey, Mike, it's okay. And I said, I'll go in the morning. And literally that morning they all came and got me on the, um, a fugitive of justice because I didn't do the rehab. That's what I thought. Okay. And so you got the Yes. Okay. And then uh, you gave the police a, another statement, and that was the March 31st, 2022, that I just told you, showed you, right? The statement about the thing that... The we, guns and every, anything else that they wanted to ask you, right? You talked about the guns with them. We'll fix that. We'll fix that at the lunch break, uh, Attorney Smith. Okay. okay. So we can proceed. So they wanted to talk to you about an investigation regarding Adam Montgomery, right? Yes. And they, you talked to them about the guns. I talked. That discussion. I talked to him about 
they, they wanted to know like all the history and then about the thing and, and then like I talked about everything I knew about Adam. <laughs> right. And you talked to them about the guns. Yes. And then uh, about a year later, we had a deposition, right? Yes. Do you, do you remember what a deposition is? I started asking yes. questions and you were under oath, yep. right? And that was just a couple of months ago, right? Yeah, it wasn't too long ago. And uh, after the deposition, um, you met with the state to prepare for this? Oh, yes, I did, yes. Okay. And where was that? It, was that also in Keene? Yep, Keene, Keene um, DOJ, I think. I don't know. It was, okay. a, it was a, like a federal building. But it was Keene? Yes. And you met with them, and you didn't look at your prior stuff, but you talked about it, right? I never looked at my, the C DVDs, you guys, that I, I, yes. Okay. So they asked you questions about some of the other things that you had said before, right? Yes. And they try, they asked you questions about maybe some inconsistencies and in things that you had said before, right? Yes. Okay. How long did you talk with them? Um, maybe like... Oh, 35, 45, 45 minutes, maybe. Okay. And you said DOJ and you said Keene. Did you ever come to Concord to talk to him? No. Okay. But you, at some point you sat down to prepare for this trial? Yes. Okay. So let's talk about how long you knew Adam. I think that you said, uh, well, uh, you got to know Adam after Kim was talking about the stolen guns, right? I got to know Adam after I after he, when he came over with Manny. Okay, and that was after Kim had talked about the stolen guns. Uh, I don't. Right? Uh, the first I don't think so. That's the first time I had met him, and then I know that I had um, Alana and um, her boyfriend around. So it was like all the same group of friends. Okay. Do you recall saying at the deposition you didn't really get to know Adam until after the guns were stolen? I, I didn't, I never really, like me and Adam honestly never really got to know each other that much at all. I mean, okay. we did drugs together and then we didn't do much else, you know, like, so. So you knew Adam for maybe a little bit of time before the guns were stolen? Yeah. Uh, maybe a couple of weeks? I'm not sure. Okay. I, I, bet, I mean, it might have been shorter, it might have been longer, I don't know. Okay. And the last time that you saw Adam was um, around what you said was this uh, sale of a gun in front of you, right? Yes. And you said that was... Uh, the last time I saw him, he came over the house with Todd Bernet, um, you know, the Bernuches, Benitez. You didn't get it right either. Pardon? You didn't get the name right either. <laughs> it was, it's, a, it's a tough one. All right. Well, in any event, uh, when you talked to, after Kim came over and accused Ish and Manny of stealing guns from her. Yes. Um, she never said that again after you talked to Ish and Manny, right? Right. Um, but all the same people were hanging around together and she said, um, she started accusing other people, right? She, she started like, like that's what I'm saying, she floated, she, floated out the the way she told me is she was she floated out the camera thing because she was unsure so she acted like she knew so like she didn't know you know she didn't know if she if they did or didn't she was acting like it okay um i think you talked at the deposition about kim talking
talking about things in front of people at your house, right? Yes. And the, she said something about the video, and it was sort of, she and Adam were joking back and forth about it. Yeah, she like, they like both laughed about it, you know. Okay. And you said almost every time that they were together at your house, uh, she would say something about the video and uh, they would joke about it. Yes. And that Adam had said, if you had a video, there would be an arrest. Yes. And that was kind of true, right? If Kim's got a video of who took her yeah. guns. And so that was a conversation that was going around in the house for a long time, right? No, that was the conversation me and him had in the car. When he said, the, the, I know she don't have cameras, Mike, because I'd be in jail right now. <laughs> the joking back and forth. Between, that was in the house, yes. Okay, and that was about her accusation that was sometimes Adam, sometimes somebody else, right? She thought Adam did it, and then, like... She actually told you, you should Manny, you're done. The, the handguns, she said that they had... She first told me that the handguns, they had taken them. And then later I had found out she made a deal when they were using the car about the handguns and they never got stolen from her. That the handguns were like part of her deal to let them use the car and all that. Well, actually, you had learned that Ish and Manny had traded the guns for drugs with her, right? Yeah, like and that. Was the car and drugs, yes. And it was the 380 and the shotgun, you said? Sustained. Okay. More than one gun, right? I believe so. Okay. And uh, that was something you learned from Manny. Um, from Ish and Manny and, like, like, all of this was, like, everybody kind of knew the, all, you know how I had a bunch of people in my house? Eventually everybody knew what happened. You know. Okay. So you said that in those conversations in the house, it was kind of comical. Kim saying she had a camera in the house. Right? Yes. And then you said at some point. So this is more than one conversation around a group of people, right? Yes. And then you say um, today that you have a drive over to Adams and you and Adam talk about the video, right? Well, we talk about Kimmy just saying downstairs that she had had a, you know, that she had, like, I got it all on camera and blah, blah, blah. And, and then when we left him around the way over to his house, he was laughing like, I know she don't have cameras, you know? Like he had been laughing all those other times when she was saying she had a camera of whoever did it, right? Yes. And she never said she had a camera of Adam, right? A video of Adam, right? That's what she was saying. She was saying like uh, that she had like had like uh, like got somebody on the side of the house or something running. You know, I don't know. She was just like trying to like fish out a confession i think from the people that were there in the place yes right? but you had already talked to her about what ish had told you that nothing was stolen he had traded that's right okay. and uh let's talk about
So I'm going to ask you some questions about your deposition. Okay. And uh, you were given a copy of the deposition, but you didn't read it, right? No, I was given a DVD. Oh, yeah, he gave me a, he did give me a copy at the end. Yeah, I didn't read it. Okay. So the DVD was before you did the deposition and you yeah. didn't watch that. No. Nope. And the deposition you got before prepping with the state for the trial. No, I got at the end of that. Okay. The last thing I was handed before I, I left. See, I see. You yeah. have not received or reviewed the transcript prior to talking to the state. Okay. And so they gave it to you to take home with you? Yes, ma'am. And did you read it? Nope. Okay. So I'm going to have some I'm questions sorry. on the deposition. Now, we talked and you said that uh, you were arrested on a fugitive from justice charge. Um, for failing to uh, go to rehab, right? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> so, I'm going to show you page 12. And you're okay with reading in front of a, mu a bunch of people? Sure. Can that happen? Okay, I'm going to ask you to read the um, maybe to the bottom of the page, and I'm going to turn to the next page when you're done. Start at top? No, in, from the middle here. From the middle. That'll do. And you didn't go to the Nope, room? nope, I'm sorry. I did mean to yourself. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Okay. And I asked you questions uh, about going to rehab and asked if uh, uh, you didn't appear, the case would not be resolved, right? Yes, yeah, right. And then um, I asked you, uh, was it a fugitive from justice charge? And you said yes, right? Yes. And um, the police were looking for you because you didn't appear at the rehab or the court date, right? I didn't appear at the rehab, or I said yes. Or the court date, right? Yes. Okay. And then you said that, uh, well, after that statement, on August 9 of 2022, your case was dropped, right? Yes. And you had told when you you had to appear for that court case after they arrested you that day, right? Yeah, I had to go back for the rehab. I didn't go to that same charge when I went in. Right before we got in, that's when I said to them, I said, hey, man, like, I just want to leave, man, just to be done with it. Like, I've tried to help you guys as much as I can. I told that to the prosecutor, not to anybody that I had talked to prior to then. Right. And he said, if that's what, let me check if that's what you did, and then I'll just let it go. So the police said that um, when you were there, that uh, they would take your cooperation in consideration and talk to the prosecutor, right? Yes. And then when you <laughs> went to court, you told the prosecutor, hey, I cooperated. Talk to the Manchester police. They'll tell you, right? Yeah, they said they'd help me and put me in jail for five days. And then I told the prosecutor when I went in, you know, like they were like, oh, you know, we'll try and the um, police were like, we'll take it into consideration, you know. And then they didn't. And then I was the first time I had to stay in jail for 
five days. Well, actually, they told you that they couldn't guarantee. Objection, Judge. It's hearsay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So at that uh, time with the police, they actually told you that, Objection. I'm sorry, Sustained. I'm sorry. You actually knew that you were going back to Valley Street, right? No, at first they were like, they had me stay actually at the police station, you know? And then they were said they were gonna be back in the morning. And when I got up in the morning, they weren't there. And then somebody else who, somebody else on shift said, we're bringing you to Valley. <laughs> Sustained. Understood that you had to go back to court before you could be released. Overruled. You understood you had to go to court before you could be released, right? Uh, they were going to try and make it so that I, you know I could get the. Um, S sustained. You understood that you would go. To they were going to. They told me they were going to try and get uh, the bail. Sustained. Listen to the question. Okay. Go ahead. So you understood that you would not be released until after you went to court, right? When I had stayed that night, they said they were going to let me try and see the... Same objection, Judge. Court. Sustained. The bailiff to be bailed out, so I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> now, you were arrested on a fugitive from justice charge, right? <laughs> Overruled. Failure to appear for your court hearings, right? A uh, failure to go to the rehab, yes. And to court, as you just saw in your deposition before, right? I had got told to go to a rehab, and then I had gotten arrested for possession like three other times, and I had, and I've never been in jail, so they had kept giving me deals. And then finally, they said, "All right, if you go to jail, this is your last chance, Mike." I didn't go, and then I knew I had a warrant for my arrest. Okay, so. Um, you went to court after the weekend was done, right? A few yes, days later. Overruled. I think it was on like a Wednesday. I ended up staying from like Friday to like Tuesday or Wednesday. And you talked to the prosecutor and you said, I've cooperated with the police. I should, these charges should go away, right? Yes. And I said, I tried to help you guys. I want to be done with this because it was, and, and, because they were going, they're about to talk. And then when he said, I said, look, I've tried to help with big thing, like big deal things. Not like, you know, I had a possession charge, and I was like, these were things that like. And he said, if I can verify that all this stuff you told him was true, then I'll let you go. Okay. And the charge. So they pended it. Huh? So then he pended it and said, I'll send yes, you. I'm, an sorry, I'm going to stop you for a minute.
Well then, just uh, there's been a lot of objections. I, I just want to be I'm clear sorry. about something. <laughs> you can answer the question as to what you knew, you thought, and you did. Okay. Do not say what someone else told you. Okay. So uh, unless, I, so I just want you to listen to the questions and just say what you thought, what you knew, what you. What What, what if it's something did. that I thought that after someone told me something? Then. Uh, the council will stop okay. you or ask you okay. a different Sorry. question, okay? Yep. The idea is that you cannot say what other people told okay. you, okay? There yep. are a few exceptions to that rule. If one of those exceptions comes up, okay. uh, the, the lawyer will let you know. Okay. Otherwise, uh, please don't share what other people said, okay? Okay. All right, go ahead. So on August 9, 2022, your felony charge of possession of a controlled drug subsequent was dropped yes okay um let's talk a little bit about timing after kim came to your place to talk about stolen guns the first time, okay? Before you talked to Ish and Manny about what she had said. You know what I'm okay. talking about? Okay, yep. I know you don't understand the date, but from that time period, you gave a description of something that happened with Adam and a gun, right? seeing Adam mentioned something about a gun in his house. You no. You said they you were, were when wait, wait, wait. You said that you were at the house and Adam said that the AR was in there pointing to a different room at the house. Right after we had left my house when okay. we were in the car going to his house when we had when they had the camera Go ahead. When they had the camera conversation then we were going over to his house after he had said that. That's when we get to the house. I meet his girl. They get high. He says, oh, it's back here because she's telling me how much. We're talking about everything that had just happened. When was that in relationship to when Kim came over and said Ish and Manny had stolen the guns and you went and talked to Ish and Manny? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That was like I had heard, you know, like, I heard she was saying that they had got stolen, and I had talked to them, and I was like, she's not being truthful about what happened, you know? The way that it happened. It yeah. wasn't yes. it was yes. trading, and it was more than one gun. Yes. And how long after those conversations were you at Adam when you, Adam's house when you say he pointed at a room and said the AR-15 was in that room? I'm not sure it was when... They were downstairs bickering and laughing at, like, because she was trying to say that the camera was there. And then. I'm talking about the day. That me she, too. Okay. That she came in and they said Ish and Manny stole the guns. From that day, when it, are you at Adam's house? At Adam's house to, do, to the time that he said it's in the back room? Uh -huh. The same day that we were downstairs and she said the camera thing to him, and then we were on our way to his house. About the day that she came in and said Ish and Manny stole her gun. Got that day? Is that a different day yes. than when you went to Adam? Yes. And how long was the day that she, how far apart was the day that she says Ish and Manny stole my guns and that you went to Adam's house? I'm not sure. It was just a topic of conversation, you know, that, like around that time. Do you know if it was days or weeks or hours? Um, if I said a time, I think I would, you know, I wouldn't be right. I'm guessing pretty close to, you know, I don't want to say pretty close to because I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But it wasn't the same day? No. Probably not the same the day after? Probably not. Maybe that week. I don't know. Maybe a week maybe. or so? Maybe, yeah. Okay. And from the time that you say that Adam pointed to a room and said the AR-15 is there, 
How long after that did you say that Adam came to your house with a gun or with two guns? Uh, I don't think it was too long because I didn't have anything at that time and they didn't have anything that day. And it was like, kind of like, uh, you know, he was trying to help me out. So are we talking maybe a week after the first time that you I'm, went to Adam's house? Yeah, I'm guessing somewhere in there, yeah, probably. Does that sound about right? Sure, sure. Not a long period of time, but not immediate? Sure. Okay. And so this might be a week or two after Kim first said that Adam, uh, the Ish and Mandy stole the guns, a week later, you might be at Adam's house and he points to that, that room is where the AR-15 is. And then maybe a week later until you say that Adam came to your place with an AR-15 and a shotgun. I think the best the best way to put it is like it was all around the same time. I can't say like, you know, I can't say like a day, seven days, fourteen. It was around the same time, okay. all of it was happening. Not the same day. Not the same day. All right. Um, when you testified today, you said. That you believe you, that you saw an AR-15 come I, to your house. Yeah, I, I saw an assault rifle. It looks. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I can't say that it's an you know, an AR-15 or a AK or I don't know anything about that stuff. Exhibit 33. I'm not going to have you hold it or anything, but can you see what's inside of that box? Yeah. What is it? An assault rifle, I guess. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does this look like what you say that Adam brought to your place? Yeah, like I saw the, the barrel and then the stock. Pardon? Like the barrel and the stock there was a sheet over like the middle of it. Was this the one that you said was loaded with bullets? What? Okay. No, the shotgun had bullets on the side of it. <laughs> ah, so it's not. It was another gun that you said. I don't think the shotgun was loaded either. It had uh, that the shotgun I saw had bullets on the side. There was like, you know, where you hold the ammo on it. So it sounds like you got a pretty good look at the assault rifle that you say that Adam brought over and the shotgun that you say Adam brought over. A pretty good look if uh, with a sheet on it. And then I was in the back, and it was dark, so they handed it. I mean, I guess. I don't know. Like, I didn't hold it. Pardon? I didn't hold it. I didn't really see the whole thing in... in, in um, like, he got it out of the trunk, was walking up to my steps, and he had it and there was a sheet over the middle of it. So I saw the barrel and the stock. Okay, so I think I heard Your you handle. say that you didn't hold it, right? Right. And on direct examination, when the prosecutor was asking about your uh, January 2020 
uh, statement that after you had gotten pulled over that time, uh, he asked if you said that you held the guns and you said that you could have. I could have held the shotgun, the AR. I know I didn't. Okay. Okay. So, um, you described Adam, as you say, coming over to try and sell a gun, and you're saying that he tried to sell it to you. I'm saying Adam came over all the time, and we would get, you know, like, we were drug friends, I guess, if that's what you want to call it. It wasn't like he only showed up, you know, as like an arms dealer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Adam showed up, and you said that he had a gun, right? Yes. And he was wondering if you were interested in buying this gun. He, that day when he came over... He was like, as he, as he was getting it out, he was trying to see if I wanted it, and I had nothing. And he was like, don't worry, I can get rid of it, and I'll get us something. Did you say something? Okay, so let's get this situation set up. You say he comes over, uh, you don't have any, you're kind of uh, dope sick, and he, um, he comes out, and it's pretty apparent, I think, that you said on direct. Yes. It's just sort of out there, and he's walking up the driveway. Corner, right? Yes. And he said, no, 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 get that out of here. Yes. And so he went, and he got in the car, and where did he go? No, he put it back in the trunk. And then we were sitting there and, and came up and when we were talking, I was like, man, I don't, like, I don't have shit either. Like, I, you know, and he was like, I can get rid of it, and I'll get us some. And where did he go? He stayed at my house, and the person was coming over, and I said, don't do it in my driveway. He moved his vehicle to the parking lot to the left of my house. Uh -huh. The person came over. We got in the, I got in the back. He was in the front, handed him the gun. He gave money and drugs, and I took some of the drugs. Okay. So you are saying that he just sort of moved over a little bit but put you in the car with the drugs so that you would have quick, I mean, with the guns in the trunk so that you would have quick access to the drugs when he uh, sold the gun. What? Say that again, please. The parking lot was within, within walking distance, right? We got in the car. I got in the back seat. They were in the front. The person was in the driver. He was in the passenger seat. He had him the gun. He handed him the stuff. Adam gave me the stuff in the back seat. I did drugs right there, and then we got out. So you had Adam move from your driveway and <coughs> move to a parking space that was within walking distance. It, it was, was probably from there. here to maybe the last um, person in the row. Okay. And um, a big parking lot that was a, it was a bar. That somebody came. Oh, you're in the back seat, and somebody comes over. It wasn't. So I knew. Who, I I recognized who it was too. It was somebody that you told police you had seen before in a complex with a brick building, um, and he and Adam had exchanged drugs and money. I had money, and I wanted to get drugs, and I couldn't get it. Adam had it. He's like, I have a guy. I always go to it if I'm not talking to you or someone at your house. I said, awesome. We went over there. It was a brick building. There was those fences that's like wood, and there's knots in the end. There's holes and like knots in the end of each fence. And we got drugs. Okay. You told police that you did uh, know the guy from a prior drug from exchange. That, from that time. I recognized the vehicle from that time and the person from that time. And that... Uh, you could take the police probably to the place that that drug exchange had happened, right? Uh, I knew it was really close to his house because we hadn't, we hadn't like, you know, I, it was in the same vicinity of his house, so I assumed I could find it. So you told the police, yeah, you, yeah, you knew where it was, right? I told him I think I could find it. Okay. And the police actually took you on a ride along after um, your interview with them in 2012. Mm -hmm. And you could not locate 
the building where you said this exchange happened, right? No. And um, they asked you if you knew the guy and um, could you go uh, identify him with a picture and you said... Um, Basis? Did they ask you oh, if you... I'm sorry. <laughs> overruled, go ahead. Did they ask you if you could identify the guy with a picture? I said no. I couldn't. I only knew that, it, like, no, I said no. Okay. Council, would you approach for a minute? about um, what you told the police about if they showed you a picture and if you don't remember then I I'll read it okay so uh, they asked if you found a picture if they found a picture of the guy do you think you could identify him and you said I mean unless like you know it would be like if I looked at it and the officer asked if it refreshed your memory or something like that you said yeah other than that so maybe a picture could have refreshed your memory, right? I, I never seen him before. I knew what his race was and the color of the car. That's how I knew him. I knew nothing else about him. I knew the car, I knew I recognized the car and the, it, what race he was. And you told them that you saw him close up, right? Uh, I was sitting in the passenger side. Adam was in the driver's side. And when we, it was like this, you know, he was in the front driver's side and Adam was in his driver's side okay but you told them that you saw him like pretty close up right yeah our cars are next to each other and they they did it through the window so a couple few feet okay. thank you Your Honor. Break. all right ladies and gentlemen uh, it's just about 12 30 so we're gonna go ahead and take our lunch break so um, a reminder, don't talk about the case, don't do any independent research, not with each other or with anybody else. Uh, and I'll have you come back at 1.30 and we will resume testimony. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, I'm gonna ask you to just stay put for a moment while we release the jurors. All rise for the jury, please. Do I have to stay all day too? You can stand, yes. But just, just No, do I stay all day? Uh, stay full.
clean up a few things that I just uh, didn't have at my fingertips before. Number one, the charge that was null crossed in August of 2022 after you told the prosecutor, hey, I gave the police information. Do you remember that? The last time I went to court, yeah. Okay. And you didn't remember if uh, it was a felony or a misdemeanor? Right. If I showed you a copy of the charge and the um, dropping of the charge, would that help refresh your recollection? If you say it's a felony, I believe you. Um, but I'll read it, too. <laughs> I'm going to show you I'm sure. a document. And this page talks about a controlled drug possession subsequent charge null prost, right? Okay. And that's August 9, 2022. Okay. And then let's look at the charge. And that was a possession of a controlled drug subsequent, right? All right. Does that sound right to you now? Mm -hmm. Okay. What does that mean? Subsequent? Yeah. You, okay. So actually, this will answer your question. So do you recall that you were charged with a possession while you had a conviction of a misdemeanor possession on your record? Oh, yes. I had a couple arrests before then, too, that I didn't go to. Okay. And that charge was from September of 2019. Right? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Now we talked about the deposition that I took of you. And um, one of the things that you said back then, because you said on direct that you knew Adam for about 16 months, was it? I mean, somewhere in there, it was long, it was like, you know, I know it was between two Christmases because then there was that he called me around Christmas asking if he could live at my house. So, okay. well, um, when I was doing the deposition, um, we were talking about the conversation that you had had with Ish, and uh, you told me about the conversation with uh, Adam that there was supposedly an RA, you believe there was an AR, like an AK, and Kimmy says, and then you say, this is like before I met Adam, that Kimmy said that he had stolen from him, right? No. Is that what you said at the deposition? No. Okay, I'm gonna ask another question, and, and <coughs> then I'll come to you with the deposition, okay? okay. And um, you said, to be honest, uh, you felt like probably traded, <coughs> but uh, you really didn't know the circumstances. But later on, after you had met Adam, Timmy said to him, I have a camera. You, you're, you're, yes. Yes.
The objection is sustained. I'm going to approach you with a copy of your deposition. And um, you've seen it. The prosecutor gave it to you, but you haven't read it. Right? Yes. And he gave it to you after he had prepared you for the testimony today, right? Yes, after I viewed the, the DVD. Okay. And this is Deposition of Michael Sullivan, March 31, 2023. Yes. And I am going to direct your attention to page 33. And if you would read along that, I'm going to ask you a question to yourself, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. okay, in that deposition, you said um, you were about to talk about what Kim was saying about the, somebody stealing the things, and you said, this is like before I had met Adam. Yeah, no, it's all right, I got it. Overruled, go ahead. <laughs> so. Wait, wait, wait. So. Uh, you're talking before that about conversations that you had with Ish, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you are asked about um, other guns, right? Okay. And you said like, there was supposedly, there was like an AR, I believe it was an AR, an AR or a K, AK, and Kimmy says, this is like- Sustained. I'm not getting into what she says. It's just this is the prelude to. Council approach. Objection sustained. So I think he said on direct that you knew Adam for a couple of weeks or so before uh, the allegations about stolen guns, right? I met Adam. I, I met Adam the night he came over with Manny. I believe that I had already talked to Kimmy prior to that. Okay. Okay. So you. Talked to Kimmy prior to May. about the car and all the that what happened that weekend and then all this shit that went down. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. All the stuff so, that went down. Isn't it true that you said at deposition when you said uh, talk about other guns and you believe it was an AR and this was like before I met Adam? Because when when we were talking about the night that me and Kimmy talked. <laughs> 
I had not had, I hadn't met Adam. Adam had gone over there, right? So when I got did the car thing for her and Ma for Manny and Ish, that's when they started coming over. Manny came over, and everybody was the same group. So I met Manny through, or I met Adam through Manny. Okay. And this was after the conversation about with Kimmy. Okay. And so um, uh, you also said that later on, um, after you had met Adam, then you talked about stuff like the camera conversation, right? Everyone talked about it because he said it to everybody. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, number two. Now, on direct, you said that uh, Adam had walked up, like taken the gun out of the trunk and walked up Mm -hmm. to your porch. And you reversed in. Pardon? Oh, reversed in my driveway, opened the trunk, grabbed it, started walking up. We were standing on my porch. I don't know who was there. There was probably 15 people at my house, like usual. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa what are you doing? Okay, so. And, like, we all laughed about it, and he put it in the back of his vehicle. Okay, and you said it was the AR-15. I said it looked like an assault rifle. Okay. I can't. I can't tell you if it was, you know, I don't know if they're, <coughs> you know, the name of the guns. Sorry about that. I agree. You did say that. But you said that it looked like exhibit 33 right i said it had a black stock and a black barrel so you don't know if it looked like exhibit 33 uh it had a black barrel and a black stock okay because you didn't see what was in the middle right correct there's a sheet over it huh yeah there was the sheet okay and when you spoke to the police in 2022, you talked about that same sort of thing happening in your driveway in the parking lot and uh, supposedly Adam selling a gun at supposedly. your house, right? Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, you said it was a shotgun. No. No. description of him coming over with a gun wrapped into a sheet and the interviewer said um, so it was just the shotgun that day right and what did I say after it that's what I'm saying he brought it he brought it he was the one selling it was a big thing I would believe it was the second one that was in there right I, uh, I feel it. Like, uh, all I know is that the 25 minutes we keep going over, it's the same. There was an AR that, it, or a, a assault rifle that he had walked up. There was a sheet over it. We went to the parking lot after the dude showed up. I mean, like, it's the same events. I can, and just like the shotgun, like, I wouldn't feel right sitting here saying that I, you know, um, like, I know for sure about the shotgun because I believe he came over to the house that's why I didn't want to bring it up you know like I can't say you know positive but I do know that a hundred percent positive that that the driveway and the gun that supposedly got sold got sold so the interviewer asked you so we know like the shotgun was traded to this guy who's a drug dealer how about the rifle and you said, I don't know what happened to the rifle. Is that right? I don't know, I guess. Okay. If that's what you're saying, I said in a deposition or a time I talked to someone. Do you want to look at your um, interview with the police officers to refresh your recollection? Sure.
show you a copy of uh, the interview that you had identified before as 331.22. Okay, is that with us? No. Okay. Remember 331.22 oh, yeah, okay, was okay. when the police had picked you up? Okay. And um, if you want to read through that, then I can ask you a question again, okay? Get it wherever you want. Don't. Okay. Okay. Do you tell Can you them show the video for that? Do we have the video? Are you thinking that this transcription? Uh, no, like I just, is this the video that I just watched in there? No. That's not the same interview? No. Okay. This is from the police on 331-22. Right, the last time when I got brought in on the... Um, the Fugitive of Justice, right? Right. Okay. Okay. And you told him that you didn't know about what happened with the rifle. Okay. Okay? Okay. <coughs> and... Uh, you talked about uh, looking at a video recently. Um, in that video, uh, you were talking about the missing Pran guns, right? Uh, I guess I looked pretty bad in that video. Like I, I didn't. I don't think that I looked at. Uh, you know, I, I was pretty sick in that video. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You were doing drugs, and they asked you uh, when they were talking about the guns. Had you seen the guns? And you said. I held them, right? I told you I thought I held the shotgun, but I was, when I came in here, I wasn't sure of it, so I wasn't going to say it. But when I look at that, it makes me feel like I was right. Okay. So fair to say that uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank okay. You. So, Mr. Sullivan, you've said this, and it may have gotten a little confused on cross. Mm -hmm. The deal you're talking about with Kim and Ish, that's regarding the pistols, correct? Yes. Sustained. The deal you were talking about with Kim and Ish, was that regarding the pistols? Yes. So there's pistols and there's long guns. Is there a yes. difference between the two? Yeah. Size. <laughs> Sorry. So you were asked a lot about your 2020 interview with law enforcement, and it sounded like you were saying you looked sick. Is that something that you? Uh, I didn't. I was in bad, bad, like you know, bad way. You just watched that video. Yeah. And you're saying you're in a bad way. Mm-hmm. Do you remember being there for that, that video? 
interview that was taken. Yeah, like, I don't, <laughs> I mean, I honestly, I don't, like, I went to, I don't remember much. I went to jail and, like, hallucinated, you know? Like, you know, it was a pretty bad time. So I don't remember much. You know, like I said, I can tell you, like, I can tell you the things that, ain't, that don't change that I know happened, and that's what I can tell you. <laughs> Let's talk about the things that don't change that you know happened. Did you see the defendant sell an assault rifle? Right in front of me. I was sitting in the back seat. I wanted him to, I wanted him to do it too. <laughs> you know, I wanted him to do it too because I wanted to get drugs. Did you see the defendant offer you the assault rifle for sale? When he came up, that's what he was there for. And then he found out I didn't have any. And he was like, I'll help you, you know? Did you tell your truth back in 2020 when you were interviewed? I don't even, I, I didn't, I've never read that interview. I didn't read the interview me and you did. You know, I just know what I know. And I'm sure that it should say it there, you know? So in your 2020 interview, you were asked, who got robbed? And let's back up. You were meeting about something totally unrelated, but it was a big... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like this, like w when we're talking about me um, not, you know, being able to have them drop my charges, it's because, not because of this, you know, it's because I... I so I, let me stop you there. The video that you just watched of making these statements about this robbery, thats that was only about four or five minutes Yes. of a two-hour, hour-and-a-half, two-hour interview. Felt like five hours. About something unrelated. Yes. Okay. And in that interview, you were asked who was robbed. You describe a couple, Kim and Chris. Yes. You were asked who robbed them. And you said, I think... Stain. Your Honor, it's impeachment. Overruled. You were asked. No, I'm sorry. The, it, the objection is sustained. Do you remember who you said robbed them? Who robbed the, the frames? Him and Chris. Ish, Adam, and Manny. Um, in your interview, though, you said, I think Ish and Manny. Objection. Overruled. Sorry. In your interview, you said, I think Ish and Manny and Adam. They gave... Adam had the guns. Yeah, but they gave for those, for the car and for the, um, you know, for the handguns and all that. They were giving her, like, they were feeding her drugs. Like, they would come back as she'd call for her car. They would come back in 10 hours as she called for eight of it. They'd give her a very little amount of drugs so that they could keep her, like, keep stringing her along. So it's not like, like, did they... Is that trading, or is that like, you know, that's, I don't think that's fair. That trade for the drugs, though, is the pistol. Is yes, that what we're talking and about? the car. Okay. And so in this conversation, you said, I think Ish and Manny and Adam, Adam had the guns, is that what you said? Yes. On the video you just watched? Yes. And then you, you were asked, you said, you were asked, did you see anyone with these guns? Do you remember what you said? Did you see anyone with these guns? I know that I saw him walk up the driveway with it. I know that... Right, you know, like, but in that interview, do you remember what your response was? To I'm not sure. You? Okay. Um, do you remember saying, yeah, Adam? I'm sure. And when you said, yeah, Adam... And I don't remember that, but I'm sure that's what I said. And when you said, yeah, Adam, in that 2020 interview, were you referring to Adam Montgomery, the defendant in this case? Yes. You were asked about a deposition you gave earlier okay. this year. And so on cross-examination, you were asked about this comment that you'd made in your deposition about a conversation between the defendant and Kim being comical. Why was that conversation comical? Because everyone knew Adam took the guns, and she was trying to... She was, not just as so she was trying on, to hold on the objection is overruled go ahead she was trying to get him to say it 
everyone knew he, he sustained. Okay. She was saying it so that she could see if Adam, if she thought she was going to have a Matlock moment and Adam was all of a sudden going to say that he did it. And then Adam, knowing that by her saying she had it, him not getting in trouble, he meant in the car, hey, I would be in jail right now. I know she's lying because I got it. He knew he had the gun, so that's why he knew he'd be in jail right now. So that was my next question. Did, did Adam say in the car the police would be called if she had a video? No, he, like, he literally was like... Did he say, I would be in jail? I would be in jail right now. <laughs> if she had a camera, I would be in jail right now. And then we went over to his house, so, so and his wife sat there, and, and we've or his about girl. That. My next question, though, I think you were asked on cross if this was a funny thing that was going on between Adam and Kim. Would, in your words, would you say it was funny? Like, it, at the time, it was like, not, not that we were like being mean to Kimmy, but everyone knew that what had happened. And even by Adam sitting there laughing, like, I feel like Kimmy knew for 100% sure, too. And it was like she was like, you know, she's hearing it from everybody tell her that he okay. said. Okay, and counsel, so stop. Approach. May proceed. Thank you. So, Mr. Sullivan, um, almost done. I just want to put what everyone else knew aside. What did you know when you were listening to that conversation? I knew that Kimmy didn't have cameras either because everyone. Sorry, let me ask you this way. When you listened to that conversation, did you know that the defendant had stolen the guns? Yes. Okay. Everyone did. Or we all did. But you knew. Yes, I knew. And like, okay, okay. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you. Right there. Anything further, Attorney Smith? So on your recent answers, you said that you knew, everybody knew about the guns. And actually earlier in your testimony, you knew from Ish that he had stolen the 380 and at least another gun. Is that right? 
the the handguns. So you're saying two handguns are stolen? Uh, Adam had the rifle, the assault rifle. I don't know if it was. Uh, I'm know, asking about the conversation with Ish. And her guns had gotten stolen. So Ish had admitted to you to stealing the. No, he didn't admit that he stole. Gun. He said. Sustained. He didn't admit that she stole. Oh, it. He said she oh, was okay. a cute. Hold okay. on. You're right. You're right. Traded. Yeah. 380 and another gun. Yes. And that's what you knew. Yes. Two guns ish. Right. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, you may sit down. Oh, I'm so sorry, you guys. Be excused. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's earlier than we would normally take a mid-afternoon break, but uh, for other reasons, we do need to take a break at this point. So I'm going to send you back into the deliberation room, and then we'll call you back in here when we're ready. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Attorney. <laughs> Dress it first, so. Come on up, Mr. Vernetches. Uh, do you want him to take the witness stand, or do you want to just do this first? Let's talk about the questions. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Vernetches. What I'm going to have you do is just, um, in fact, you can just sit right there at the table behind the prosecutors. Um, because I want to, I want you to understand what the questions are going to be. And then we have to. Well, so we first have to decide uh, whether or not you need a lawyer, and I want you to hear what the questions are. The parties have agreed to tell you what the questions are, so that we can make a reasonable determination as to whether or not we can proceed with you today. 
Um, and if not, then we'll assign you a lawyer and we'll take the next steps that we would normally take for somebody who is going to invoke the Fifth Amendment, okay? So just sit down and listen carefully to what the state uh, intends to ask you about, okay? Um, so, Attorney Gotti, go ahead. Thank you. Nine questions that we intend to ask Mr. Bramanich if he's following up with his lawyer. How old he is? What city does he live in? How long has he lived there? Whether he wants to be there right now. Does he know someone named Adam Montgomery? At one point in 2021, was he living at the same address with him? Did Adam Montgomery tell him that he sold a gun to a person named Ish? Did officers ask you if they could show you some photos to identify Ish? And you stated no. And saying to the officer specifically no because you are not a snitch. Those are the nine questions. Okay. So essentially, uh, where is the city that Mr. Bermanich lives in now, we're not asking for his home address. Whether or not he wants to be here right now, does he know someone named Adam Montgomery? whether he was residing with him at one point in 2021, not where they were residing or how they came to be residing with each other, whether the defendant, whether Adam Montgomery told him that he had sold a gun to a person named Ish, whether officers asked if they could show some photos to identify this person named Ish, and whether he told those officers no, because he is not a snitch. Those are the nine questions. And based upon those nines, not asking where Mr. Burnett lives, lives now, not asking where he was residing in 2021, we do not feel that the answers to those nine questions would somehow trigger a Fifth Amendment privilege. Um, okay, so uh, you've heard those questions. Do you have any objection to answering those questions? Yeah, I'm not going to answer any questions. So uh, let's see what the questions would be from the defense. He hung out at Somerville Street with Mike, uh, his wife, and several other people. He did drugs uh, at Summer Street with Mike and other people that hung out there. Uh, I will be asking him a question that I don't know the answer to because in his report he had indicated that he was messing around with Kim Frayne and I'm not sure if he was saying that Mike was or that he was having a relationship with her. And uh, if it was Mike, then um, the time period that that was going on, um, that I would be asking if um, he had gone to Kim's house to um, get high on crack with her, which I believe he will say yes to, because I believe it was him saying that he was messing around with Kim. Um, I will ask if they were buying and selling drugs uh, together, he and Kim. I will ask if uh, he had heard a rumor about her, Kim Fran's husband, getting guns stolen or robbed. And he said that he'd heard the rumor, but he couldn't confirm that it was Adam. And that I will talk about some of the things that the police were saying to him and that he eventually said that um, at first he had never seen Adam with the shotgun and Adam had never given him guns and uh, that all he had was a claim that Adam said he was selling guns um, and that this occurred while Todd was in jail. And there's a few related to that kind of questioning. Oh. All right. Um. And I, sorry, there was more to follow up on Ish, that he knew Ish, he said he knew Ish, his description of Ish, um, and uh, that is Ish someone that he also hung out with at uh, Mike's house. All right, council approach.
So uh, you're here today, that's because you understand that you're under subpoena and you have an obligation to be here, um, and that is important. I think uh, you know that f a failure to appear on, uh, can result in a warrant being issued, and, um, and so you are here. I understand your concerns. Um, I'm, whether you have a privilege to assert is, an, is uh, another question. You can't just assert in order to choose not to say anything. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to appoint you a lawyer, okay, so that you'll be able to consult with counsel. I'm going to have you come back on Monday. Uh, why don't we have you come back at 1230? Um, so I do need to have a current, we, we're going to need some current contact information for Mr. Bernatchez. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to, so this, either the state victim witness advocate or somebody, uh, will work with the court to get some contact information for a lawyer. Uh, as soon as you get that information, you should make every effort to contact that lawyer so that you can speak to them in advance of Monday's hearing. We'll have you come back Monday at 12.15. I don't know exactly when the testimony will break. It may be ongoing, and uh, you may need to be here for a little while. You're, you, once you contact your lawyer, your lawyer may want you to get here earlier so you can consult with the lawyer. Uh, but then on a lunch break with the jury, we'll have some further conversation about what has to happen with regard to your testimony, okay? Um, we do have Mr. Bernatchez's phone number. If we could just confirm what his address is. 315 Cedar Street. So okay. And, Ms. and Mr. Bernatchez, do you have a lawyer you've been working with for any of your John own? John J. Brisa. What? John J. Brisa. To, oh, uh, Attorney Brisa. Okay, I don't know if that would be who would be appointed to you, um, but I can let them know uh, downstairs that that's somebody that you've worked with. Um, you can also call Attorney Brisa if you wish to do so to let him know, um, and we will, you know, we'll get you counsel, and I'll see you again on Monday. Okay. All right. Very good. All right, uh, so what do we have with regard to the next witness? I think that at this point, it would probably be wise for us to go ahead and discuss that matter regarding Mr. Zimmerman. Okay. Because ideally, he would be the next witness after this, and it just kind of makes sense to go right from uh, Ms. Hilbert as witness directly to Mr. Zimmerman. Very good. So let me do this. Uh, you shared with the court earlier the response to the question uh, regarding the nexus of his statements and the 77 Guilford Street address. I presume that what you were reading from was provided to the defense. It was, Your Honor. I received it by email last night. The defense counsel received it by email last night. I believe Trent Mills had received it uh, just prior to the two of us. Okay, so rather than have you read that again, uh, I don't think that's necessary. Mr. Montgomery wasn't in the room at the time, but you've shared that with him, Attorney Smith? Yes. Okay, so maybe it makes sense for me just to hear your response rather than have them go over what's in there. And rather than go over everything that we said before yes. about the different conversations, I do want to make it abundantly clear that Josh's first statement First of all, that uh, Josh and Tara had several conversations with Adam Montgomery, but that Josh said he didn't really start communicating with Adam Montgomery until um, six months uh, after Adam Montgomery had moved into Union Avenue. And then the converse, uh, about a year later, which I said was not clear if it was a year after moving in the union or a year after they started talking that um, Adam was getting paranoid and um, talking about the ATF. So I'm sorry, was it a year after he moved in or a year after <coughs> the six month communication? I, I cannot tell oh, you don't from know. Okay. the report that was provided to us that these were <coughs> Okay. And 
that um, uh, that was the circumstance for Adam talking specifically about an AK-47 firearm. Um, Josh said he never saw any firearms and that Adam never tried to sell him firearms. So uh, that was essentially when he said that uh, Adam, and essentially what they're trying to get from Mr. Zimmerman is that Adam bragged about selling firearms. And then it was specifically to the AK-47. So then the question was, when Tara Hebert said that uh, Adam had talked about um, an AR-15 being the sickest gun he ever had, was that conversation that Tara was talking about the same as the conversation with Josh? And it was A and B, did Josh actually hear that? So in Terry Hebert's uh, interview, she said that... Um, Is it Hebert or Hilbert? I'm, I'm doing Hilbert. that, I'm sorry. Hilbert, Hilbert. okay, okay. Um, said that on several occasions, between February 2020 and su summer of 2020, Adam, Adam bragged about selling guns at his house. So first of all, that's a time period before Josh had started talking to Adam. I think I said that Adam moved into uh, Union in March, and Adam said it was really, uh, Josh said it was really about six months before he started really talking with Adam, and again, that year problem, but even at the shortest part, a year later is when Adam was talking about the guns. So their time period is different. Um, she did not say that it was when he was at 77 Guilford. She said that she believed that to be after seeing a press release. And uh, Josh's specific uh, reference to that on this newest interview is that um, his understanding was it was something Adam had done in his past while when living on Guilford Street. Um, he's unsure if Adam sold guns while living on 60, 644 Union Street. His understanding about that is not the same as Adam said that while living at 77 Guilford Street, da da. Um, so I still do not think that they've made the connection to the conversation that Josh purportedly had with uh, Mr. Um, Montgomery starting perhaps a, earliest a year after moving into Union Street while he was paranoid about the FBI and um, let's see, because uh, it sounds like the paranoia about the FBI was what led to him, and that was something that was going on at Union Street. That that had, although it may have to, had something to do with the past, had anything to do with 77 Guilford Street, the particular conversation that Josh is referencing. And. Um, It was. I believe it was the this morning the statement regarding Josh Zimmerman's statement. I think we were on record when we were doing that. Yes. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. I would like to see a copy actually, if you wouldn't mind.
Attorney Smith has referred to the two Zwicker letters that were provided from both of these individuals from the police. We have copies of those as well. Okay, one moment, please. So I just want to better understand something. According to this, uh, Tree Smith, Zimmerman stated the conversation he and Tara had with Adam happened a few months into Adam and Kayla living on Union Street. Uh, so I'm not sure. Um, no, one second. So I'm so I'm trying to better understand why you think it was a year after he moved into Union Street. These are what you're reading is like the third follow-up. Yes. With Mr. So where does his it come? Original statement was. That's what I was referring to. Okay. He originally talked about the statement at. Sorry. That's okay. I'm just going to take a look. Yet yeah. when he his original statement. What page are you providing? Uh, sorry. Sorry, that was just me holding <laughs> out my hand. So. Um, so five, it's 507? Right. That's what I'm looking at, right? Good. 509. 509. Oh, that's 507 oh, is a different okay. sort of marking. Okay, that's all right. Uh, I'll be looking at the second paragraph, yeah. second line. And then after that, a year before they started talking. Okay, so um, I think, you know, as I said yesterday, was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday, um, that I, I do think to the extent that there is a, a connection uh, with the Guilford Street address and or the conversation that Tara Hilbert also had uh, with the defendant and the state can lay a foundation for that, which I think they have here, obviously subject to cross-examination of any prior inconsistent statements, that it is admissible. However, there's a lot of other information here that I don't think uh, is necessarily admissible. So, you know, the original... There are many other things within the report talking about uh, their interactions with individuals that they had seen and other conversations. I would agree with you that's not something the state's seeking to elicit at all. Okay, so, but I want to be clear about that, that what we're avoiding here is this, you know, all of this propensity evidence that, you know, if the state is looking to just get into this notion that he was uh, and repeatedly engaged in, you know, uh, lots of firearm sales and the AK-47, and if, I mean, if there's, if there's an issue with the confusion that you want to ask him about, about an assault rifle, I think that that's permissible, um, even though he called it something different and certainly, uh, certainly appropriate for cross-examination or for direct examination. But I am cautioning, you know, I am cautioning the state, A, you need to lay the foundation that's set forth in these documents before you ask him about uh, the content of the conversation. And to the extent you think that they, the state hasn't laid a foundation consistent with my rulings here, Attorney Smith, uh, that will be subject to contemporaneous objection. But if they, if they do lay the foundation as we've discussed, then I do think it is admissible, despite the fact that there, you know, there may be some inconsistencies here. It sounds that he's connecting it to the Guilford Street address. He's connecting it to the conversations that were also had with Tara Hilbert. Um, and there are some other specifics here, but absent, if they can't do that when he gets on the stand, I'll hear an objection, okay? I would like to offer to you, I understand your ruling, 
but to put on the record that I will not be crossing Mr. Zimmerman about the distinction between, uh, about the FBI, about other statements. The most that I can, because obviously it raises that specter anyway. My position is it has taken them three chances at the Apple to get to the information that they want to get. Two of those opportunities were after we filed the motion so that they knew my objection to what they were saying. On that second one, they still didn't get the information that they wanted. And then the third one was just recently after talking to you and you making very clear what they wanted. And quite frankly, I think the connection that they made is still very um, iffy. And I would say that this statement is so unreliable that the prejudice in admitting it, the prejudice between my inability to cross because to cross, I have to go into territory that should not be a part of this trial. And I know that I'm making that choice, but I am making that choice because the prejudice of this to make that, the fact that that connection does not exist, um, the prejudice outweighs any probative value to this, especially since Ms. Hebert will be saying something along those lines as well. And that my inability to cross without opening up uh, inadmissible evidence, I think the prejudice outweighs any probative value and that it should not be brought in. I would also put on the record, and, and you said the other stuff that's there would include the FBI, the paranoia, all of that other character reference to something that is not involved in 77 Guilford Street. Okay, so I, I think you, you raise an important point, which is how narrowly we're going to view these other things. Um, because I do think that at some point you do veer into an area that is uh, is too prejudicial. So this notion that you know he was afraid of the ATF and that they were after him because he was selling guns, this sort of broader picture um, that I'm sure the the state you know would like to paint, i I, I think that's too broad a picture. Um, I mean, that, that he had a conversation with him about having s sold guns at 77 Guilford Street, I think is admissible. But I think going beyond that, oh, sorry. going beyond that is going to veer into territory uh, for which there isn't clear, necessarily clear proof. And, um, and it just may be uh, too prejudicial, not sufficiently probative of these offenses. So. And, and Your Honor, I think the state certainly understands what your feelings are with regards to that on this particular matter of this case. I can't say necessarily that the state agrees with regards to uh, the paranoia aspect of what the defendant has said. At that point, that could be used as an easy defense by the defendant for any of the particular gun crimes, or have to say that there has to be clear proof between one of his multiple gun crimes that he is accused of to go be uh, correlated to his paranoia. I think it's a reasonable inference to say that this particular charge that this jury is asking to consider, given the other statements about an AR-15 and a rifle here at Guilford Street, provides that nexus to be able to get into it. But I understand the court's ruling. One of the things I want to make also very clear for the record, and if Your Honor would like a copy again, I do have a copy of those two sort of letters. I feel it's a mischaracterization of the law to state that everything that's coming in with regards to Mr. Zimmerman only is coming in in this very last interview. The vast majority of what he has said, even back to the last week we went before, was that the defendant had discussed having guns before at his last home and hiding in the walls. That last home would have been 77 Guilford Street. Your Honor asked us to clarify specifically which street, and so we have done that. The implication that was just made, that this is brand new information, that somehow that makes it so prejudicial that there could be no sort of cross-examination, is inaccurate compared to the information that's provided in the timing of that information. So the state certainly understands the restrictions that the court wants us to follow. With regards to that, I will ask for maybe just five or ten minutes to tailor my questions to be able to follow that 
along with the guidelines that the court has provided. But to say that no cross-examination is possible on those areas, I, I just think really mischaracterizes the evidence in the discovery. So, and if you'd like to mark for identification, just for the record, those prior statements, I think that's fine. The court has reviewed, you know, in coming to my prior ruling, I have what you had previously given me. I'm sorry, Attorney Smith, I took your, for your <laughs> copies of these so that I could take a look. Um, but I think, what, so I'm just giving those back to you. Did you want me to make a copy I'm, for the record? Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Attorney Agati is going to mark them for the record, and we can do that after if we want to. Um, but there I think I think his I, I think it is admissible. Uh, the information related to these firearms at the Guilford Street address, uh, his concern about ATF, um, but not. But I don't. You know, we we are not going to be talking about this as if. Uh, you know, he, he about whether or not he's an overall gun dealer of all sorts of other firearms. We're not, we're not doing that. Okay. So narrowly tailored questions, laying the foundation, connecting it to this case. And the state said they were putting together a package which included a couple of Zwicker letters. I would object to the May 31st, 2023 Zwicker letter because it's referencing the actual interview, the report of which I think should be introduced, not the Zwicker letter regarding the report. This is just for, just just, they're just for, they're just for identification, not to be used for the jury. It's just for, for, the, for the issue of appeal. Right, but I think the Zwicker letter represents something slightly different from the actual report. So uh, the Zwicker letter on May 31 is really irrelevant because it's referencing Report. But I'm not going to preclude the state from marking something for identification. Okay. Um, and, and I'll be happy to take the one from the 31st as well. I was actually intending to do this with a letter from the 28th prior to that. You said two, so that's what I was wondering. Well, I also had Ms. Hilbert's. Letter and, all right. I, I haven't, so, I mean, I think you all have made the arguments with regard to the content of those for the purposes of the court's decision on this issue. And if there's something else you think I need to know from those, you can let me know, but that, I... I don't believe so, Your Honor. Okay. Like I said, just uh, we'll want a couple of minutes to, to okay. do some quick editing. So right now. Um, why don't I, I'm gonna, why don't I have, go off the record so the monitor can take a quick break now, and then once we're, you're ready, we'll launch right into it, okay? Very good. We'll just wait so you take a break. Okay. Yeah. And as soon as as soon as we're ready, we'll come back. Yes? Uh, yeah.
Please be seated. Thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, from time to time, things arise that we either don't expect or have other uh, related business that we need to deal with. So uh, I very much appreciate your patience. And when the state is ready, you may call your next witness. State calls Ms. Tara Hilbert to the stand. Remain standing for a brief moment when you get there. Thanks. Um, can you please raise your right hand? First thing I'd like to do is swear you. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony will give this jury be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So we go. Yes. Thank you. Please feel free to have a seat. There's some water there if you need a drink or anything else. If you need a break, just let us know. Okay. Thank you. All right. And uh, one thing, if you're go as we're going through today, since we're being recorded, could you please state your first and last name and spell both of them as well? Tara Hilbert, T-A-R-A-H-H-I-L-B-E-R-T. Okay. And Ms. Hilbert, what town do you live in right now? Manchester, New Hampshire. Okay. How long have you been living here in Manchester? Uh, almost seven years. Seven years now? Okay. And... Um, Ms. Hilbert, I apologize for the delay. So with regards to there in Manchester, um, are you working right now? No. Okay. Um, is there, uh, where are you living? What's your address? 137 Orange Street, Apartment 2. Apartment 2. How long have you been on Orange Street at Apartment 2? Seven years. Seven years? All right. Um, uh, for uh, 137 Orange Street, do you own that building or are you renting? Renting. Uh, is there anything, besides obviously paying rent, is there anything else that you're doing uh, for your landlord to help pay for the rent? I clean out the apartments that are being moved out of after they move out, and then I take out the trash barrels at each property that he owns for the trash days. About, um, on average of any given week, about how many hours of your, of your week is spent doing those sort of tasks and duties? Uh, it really all depends because some of them, some of the trash areas are like horrible. So I'll spend, I'd say probably three hours a week at each or like all week. And what are the different uh, addresses that you have to go to to do this? Uh, you need the exact number of well, each. Just roughly maybe number of buildings just so the jury gets Oh, oh okay. Uh, there's five, including my building, there's six, six properties. Six properties altogether. Yes. Okay. Um, and so with that, um, specifically, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the relationship between the building where you live at 137 Orange Street with another address, a 644 Union Street. Are, how are those two buildings related? Are they close together? Are they not close together? Can you kind of describe that for us so we get an understanding? We, my building and that building share the same parking lot in the back of my building and in the back of that building. So my building to that building is probably 25 feet away from each other. 25 feet away? Yeah, if you're like at the corner of my building to that corner of that building, like the closest corner, it's probably 25 feet. I'd like to go ahead and show you, I'd like to go ahead and show you State's Exhibit uh, 19 and then 18. I'm gonna have you take a look at these just for a second. And let me show you State's Exhibit 19 first. Um, uh, do you uh, do you recognize this area or what's depicted in this photo? Yes. Okay. What is this? What is depicted here? It's where I live. Okay. Where you right live? Right there. And that's 644 Union Street. All right. In fact, is there any sort of label of that 644 Union Street on this image? Do we see something that says that? Yes. Okay. And the other address of where you said you lived? Okay. Uh, is there anything that we can see on that picture that kind of marks uh, or indicates that that is the building? That is 137 Orange. Maybe that red dot. A red dot on it? Yeah. Okay. All right, let me show you State's Exhibit 18 now. And 
with regards to this image, um, can we see your house, 137 Orange Street, from this address? Yes. Okay. And can we also see 644 Union Street from this address? Yes. You said a moment ago there's a parking lot. Can we see that in this photo? Yes. If I were to be able to kind of put, blow these up and put them on the big screen, would that be, uh, would the, you find that helpful to be able to kind of explain how the two buildings are next to each other? I think so. Okay. I'm going to turn your attention, if you would, just for a brief moment, please, uh, Ms. Hilbert, to um, the image on your screen, States Exhibit 19. That's the same photo I just showed you a moment ago, right? Yes. And I wondered if you could go ahead and um, Actually, do you mind stepping uh, down a little bit, Your Honor, with your permission? That's fine. And do be careful of the boards right there. I was wondering if you could just kind of point to where 644 Union Street is here. Okay. So that is, just one second, you're pointing over here to this building? Yeah. And with regards to your own address, the 137 Orange Street, where is that? Did I zoom in accurately on that? The right building? Yes. And which floor is your apartment? First floor. First floor? Okay. I wish I could have timed that a little bit better. <laughs> um, so, separate from this, I'd like to also go to States Exhibit 18 for a brief second if I can. And you see that's the same image we just looked at a moment ago? Yes. Now, from here, from this perspective, uh, just generally point out the parking lot that you share between the two buildings. And typically, where uh, Orange Street, which one is yours again? Which, uh, which building? This one. That one there. And at that particular building, where do you often end up parking your car? My car is right here. Oh, just underneath? Yes. Okay. And with regards to uh, the Union Street, folks who are living at Union Street, do they have any restrictions on where they can park, or can they park anywhere within the lot? Anywhere within the lot. Um, I want to draw your attention over to the right-hand side of this image, and I'll zoom in here. Um, is that the back of the building you pointed out, the 644 Union Street? Yes. Okay. Um, seeing a lot of brown there, could you kind of explain to us what that is? That is the back porches. Back porches. Um, is that a separate entrance from the front uh, from the front door? Yes. Do people sometimes use that as a primary means of entrance, or is it always secondary? What is it? Most people use the back as their main entrance. As their main entrance. Yes. Okay. And with regards to that, zoom out again so we can see the whole image of States Exhibit 18. Um, uh, having lived there for seven years, is that right? Yes. Okay. How often uh, do you find yourself interacting with people who are living at the Union Street uh, address uh, compared to you folks who are living on Orange Street? Um, a lot, because I'm really friendly, so I try to meet everybody. Okay, fair enough. Well, thank you very much. Please feel free to go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. So now that we understand this kind of general area, I'm going to ask whether or not uh, while you were living on Orange Street, um, you said you've been living there for about seven years, correct? Yes. All right, so that would include 2019 and 2020. Is that yes. right? All right. Um, how did you first uh, end up meeting Adam Montgomery and Kayla Montgomery? Like talking-wise meeting? Without going into the specifics of what the conversations were that you had, but I'm just generally wondering where that might be, especially given the maps that we looked at here. Um, had you met them over at Union Street? Had you met them at your address in the parking lot? Where? It was in the back. In the back section? Like the back, right in the back of my building. Okay. Actually, if you want, I'll zoom in here. We're still going to see Escape Exhibit 18. Uh, am I pointing out the back of that, that, that building where you're talking about? Yes. Okay. And when you met them, where had they, um, where were they residing? At 644 Union Street, Apartment 2. Apartment 2. What floor is Apartment 2 on? Second floor. Second floor. Okay. How often did you talk with them? Uh, at first, it was just very vaguely, and then it got, as the summer approached and the nice weather came, 
they'd bring their kids out more, and we had kids, so they'd all just play, and we'd just socialize. What were the ages of, of your kids? My daughter was uh, four at the time. Okay. And uh, obviously your daughter was living with you, I take it, right? Yes. You said we. Uh, so who else lives at your home with you? My fiance. And what's his name? Josh Zimmerman. When you met Adam Montgomery and Kayla Montgomery, um, uh, did you know or did you learn uh, what Adam Montgomery was doing for work at that time? No. Okay. Did you ever give him a ride to work sometimes? Yes. Okay. And where did you give him a ride to work? Home Depot. How many times did you do that? Uh, maybe 10. Maybe 10? Yeah. At some point, I'd like to ask, or actually, let me ask this. Uh, had you ever been inside of their apartment while they were living there? No. Okay. Had they ever been inside of your apartment while yes. you were living there? And when I say they, I just want to be very clear. I'm talking about Kayla Montgomery and Adam Montgomery. Yes. How many times uh, had Adam Montgomery been inside your apartment while they were living there? Uh, I'd say just a couple, probably five, maybe. Um, what were the reasons uh, why in general? And, and I guess maybe, did you spend a lot of time socializing with each other or these specific reasons why somebody would come over? We were cooking on the grill and it was really hot out okay. those nights, so we let all the kids go in. We'd all sit in the AC and eat. Okay. Um, at some <laughs> point, uh, what, if anything, did Adam Montgomery tell you about owning a rifle? That he had guns that he was selling and didn't say that he owned them just that he had guns at one point in time before living at this address and with regards to the rifle how did he describe this rifle that he owned that it was an AR-15 uh, did he say anything else about it any other details about the gun no nothing about the gun and where did he say he had kept that gun? At an address that he lived at that his grandmother had owned that was foreclosed on. And one that his grandmother had owned that was foreclosed on, am I yes. getting that right? All right. And what street did he, was that on? That you I didn't know at the time, but after seeing the address on the news before it was... Okay, the, well, I just want to... Uh, questions withdrawn, Your Honor. I'll probably restate. I mean, you should uh, not consider the last question or answer. With regards to the street, specifically, did Adam Montgomery ever tell you what street it was? Or no. no. All right. So he did not. And you say, where did he say he had kept the gun inside this previous address? Walls and ceilings. Walls and ceilings. And this is the home you said he told you had been foreclosed on and they had been kicked out of. Yes. <coughs> What, if anything, did he tell you about whether or not he was being investigated for these guns? He didn't say anything about being investigated. He didn't say anything about being investigated? Like, he didn't have police contact. Like, yeah. Um, I apologize. I should restate the question. I, I should have been more clear. Um, did he ever state to you that he believed he was being investigated for these guns? Yes. Okay. And what did he say about that? that the ATF was after him. What, if any, incidents did you see that, I'm sorry, let me restate that question. Did you see any incidents uh, involving him that either confirmed or dispelled uh, your belief of whether he thought he was being investigated? Uh, I wouldn't see him for days, him or Kayla. So I figured they were just trying to hide in the house for a while. Hide in the house for a while? Yeah, because they literally wouldn't come out of the house. Did he ever exhibit any other behavior um, about that same belief that he was being investigated by the ATF for these guns? Um. I don't know if I should like go into detail about. Okay, um, let me re withdraw the question then, and I'll restate a different one. Okay. okay. Um, 
What was his behavior like as he went on to live next door? Uh, very um, scared, thinking people were after him. What did you, and if you're saying that that's what he was thinking, I want to know, I guess more specifically, what did you see that made you believe that? What behavior did you see from him that made you believe that? He was hallucinating. <laughs> Hold on just a minute. There's an objection, so we just have to wait a second. Faces? Yes. Thank you. When you, um, you stated before that uh, the defendant had been, uh, the previous house that he had been living, excuse me, that where Mr. Montgomery, uh, Adam Montgomery had been living, had been foreclosed on. I believe you said it was his mother's house or grandmother's house? Grandmother's. Grandmother's house. Is that something that he told you? Yes. All right. Thank you. And during the conversation about these guns, did you ever... Or was Kayla Montgomery ever present for those conversations? Yes. She was? Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Hilbert. I appreciate your time. I don't have any further questions for you, but I believe Defense Counsel will have a couple. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Hilbert. I'm Robin Davis. I'm just going to ask you a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, you said that you met Kayla and Adam um, at the Union Street address, and that was in uh, uh, 2020, is that correct? Yes. And was that early 2020? Yes. Do you know what month? No. They moved in early 2020, and I'd say it was probably March, April. March or April, okay. <clears throat> Could have been as far back as February? No, not that close. Not right when they moved in. Do you speak to the police in regards to um, when Adam and Kayla moved in? Yes. If I showed you the police report, would that refresh your recollection? No, I remember it. Okay. So... You, um, you met Adam and um, Kayla at the 644 Union Street. That was not your building. Correct. But you were a property manager there. Correct. And in that time, you indicated that uh, you became friendly with Adam and Kayla? Yes. Uh, but you were more friendly with Kayla, is that right? Yes. And... I think you said you only on a few occasions had you interacted with Adam. Yep. And during that time, you indicated that Adam had bragged about selling guns. Yes. And you indicated that that happened on three occasions. It was two or three, yeah. Okay. So in the whole time that you had interactions with Adam or Kayla, only three times did you hear this. Yes. And when was the last time you saw Adam and Kayla at the Union Street address? Um, I know Kayla was June 2021. I think Adam was April 2021. Okay. So over a long period of time. Yeah. And during the time he was uh, bragging about guns, you never saw him with any guns? No. He never showed you any photos of any guns? No. And even at his house, there were no guns? I don't know. I never went in. You went to their house one time, you said? No. Okay. And 
again, you spoke with the police, uh, including the ATF and the Manchester police, ab about uh, being friendly with Adam and Kayla. Yes. And you spoke with them in uh, 2022, is that correct? Kayla in 2022. No, you spoke with the police. Oh, oh, yeah. In regards yeah, to your sorry. relationship in March of 2022. Yes. Okay. So that those conversations um, were about two years after you had met Kayla. Yes. And Adam. And you said that Adam had left earlier in the year from the Union Street address. Yes. And then Kayla remained there. Yes. Um, and you continued to be friends with her even after she left the Union Street address, didn't you? A little bit, yeah. Not as close as we were, just kept in contact. But you continued to speak with her? Yes. Okay. And you continued to speak with her even um, when she was arrested and incarcerated? Yes. Okay. You continued to have conversations with yes. her? Yes. Okay. And is that fair to say that uh, you still have conversations with her? No. When was the last conversation you've had with Kayla? Um, well over a year and a half ago. Well over a year and a half ago? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, I have nothing for there. Thanks. Two quick questions. Ms. Hilbert, um, you said before, or you were just talking a moment ago about the defendant um, referring to in writing about having all of these guns. Yes. Um, I just want to ask again, do you recall any other details about the no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further? I just had a follow up. Okay, go ahead. You spoke to the Manchester police in uh, 2022 for the first time about Adam and Kayla, correct? Yes. And at that time, you never mentioned anything about an AR 15. And then they recontacted you in 2023. What? Just recently, you spoke with the police again in yes. May yeah. of, of this year. Yes. Okay. And that was in preparation for this testimony here today. Yes. Okay. Uh, and you knew that this uh, trial was about firearms, correct? Yes. And it was on that date, May. 26 that you remembered the AR-15? No. You didn't tell the state? Like, I remembered it. I don't, should I go, I don't know if I should go into detail. <laughs> yes.
finish first. Uh, just for clarification, I asked you uh, about the police speaking with you on March 9th of 2022. I don't know the exact date, but yes, it was in March 2022. Okay, the year yes. 2022. Yes. You recall that. Okay. Uh, and at that time, you indicated that Adam was bragging um, about the sale of guns. Yes. Okay. And uh, that he had uh, specifically mentioned an AR-15. Yes. Okay. But you never saw any guns. No. Anything further for the state? No, nothing further for the state. All right. Uh, you may step down. Thank you. We've asked the witness to be excused. Any objection? All right. This witness may be excused. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to clarify something with you. Uh, you probably have noticed that certain witnesses indicate that they're not sure how to answer a certain question. And um, as you know, the defendant was arrested on an unrelated matter to this case. And so witnesses have been instructed that they're, they're not to talk about unre those kinds of unrelated matters. Um, so it may be that the answer, when they are not sure about, uh, about answering a question that may bring, bring up something related to the unrelated matter, they indicate that they're not sure how to answer that question and then uh, the parties will move on, okay? Um, all right, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. At this point, the state would like to call Mr. Joshua Zimmerman to the stand. Keep your voice up. Okay, very good. And uh, Mr. Zimmerman, in a minute, uh, you're going to be asked some questions. I'm going to ask you to keep your voice up. It's a big room, and everybody needs to be able to hear you. And I'll remind the lawyers to please do the same. Will okay. do. Thank you, Your Honor. My apologies, um, Mr. Zimmerman. I am. I apologize. I'm going to have to have you stand up again for a brief moment, if you could, please. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you will give this jury will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you, sir. Please feel free to have a seat. <coughs> Mr. Zimmerman, as we're being uh, reported here today, would you please state your first and last name and spell them both? Let's spell them first and spell them both. Joshua Zimmerman, J-O-S-H-U-A-Z-I-M-M-E-R-M-A-N. And Mr. Zimmerman, what city do you live in? Manchester. How long have you been living here in Manchester? Uh, about seven years. About seven years. And uh, with regards to your address, what's your street address? Where do you live? 137 Orange Street. How long have you been living there at that address? Seven years. Seven years, okay. Um, with regards to uh, your education, so we just get an idea of the background. Uh, how far did you go in school? Uh, I graduated high school. Okay. And uh, what sort of different jobs have you had over your life's lifetime? Mostly painting, contractor. And is that what you're doing for work now? Yes. Um, and what I want to ask, and actually I want to go ahead and draw your attention to the screen for a minute. I'm going to show you an image here that has... So let me show you State's Exhibit 19 first. Um, do you recognize 
um, the area of the city that's depicted in this photo? Yes. Okay. And there's a marking here that says 644 Union Street. Do you recognize that 2B, 644 Union Street? Yes. All right. Where is your house in relation to that? It is behind it. Behind it? Okay. Yeah. And uh, were you, a moment ago, I just want to make sure I'm preserving the record here. Uh, were you pointing to the building that seems to almost have a red dot on it? In the center? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 18. Um, does this also show where you live, the building you live on, uh, 137 Orange? Yes. All right. And uh, what about 644 Union Street? Can you see it here? Yeah, it's right there. All right. Um, the parking lot that you share between those buildings, uh, excuse me, let me retract that. Uh, the parking lot, does that uh, cover just 137 Orange Street or does it cover other buildings in the area? It covers the four buildings. It covers the four buildings? Okay. And so can we see all four buildings in this picture? Yes. So all four buildings get to share that same lot, is that right? Yep. Uh, kind of give us an idea of the level of interaction. How much uh, do you see other residents talking with one another when they're all sharing the same building? Quite a bit. Quite a bit. All right. Let's go ahead and put States Exhibit 18 down. I'd like to ask, have you ever met an individual by the name of Adam Montgomery? Yes. And how did you meet Adam Montgomery? Um, in passing, neighbors. In neighbors? Do you know where he lived? Yep. Right. Where did he live? Right next to me. <laughs> right next to you. Okay. Um, and I apologize. I'm making sure. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Okay. Uh, obviously, I imagine it, nobody's comfortable necessarily on the witness stand, but uh, if you need a break or if you need water or something, just let us know, okay? Okay. All right. And with regards to that, um, in meeting Adam Montgomery. Um, were, you, were you living at the Orange Street address at the time? Yes. Same one where you still live now? Yes. Um, and I want to be very specific with you. Um, what, if anything, did he tell you about uh, owning a rifle? He said he had one and he sold it. And he was uh, scared about the ATF afterwards. Okay. So let me kind of break that down. So he said to you that he had a rifle and owned it, and, and what did he do with it? He sold it. He sold it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, what do you recall about how, what the rifle was like, how he described the rifle? Um... I don't know the difference between a rifle and an AK-47 and an AR, but it was it was a rifle. That's okay. what I got out of it. It was a rifle. Did he describe it any more than that, other than to say it was that style of rifle? No, not really. Okay. And when when did he tell you he had this rifle? Before he lived there. Before he lived there. Do you know where he was living before he lived there at Union Street? I don't know the exact address. Okay. Do you remember just generally the street? No. Okay. So right now you don't recall the street, but it's where he was living before he came to Union Street. Yeah. On, on that particular issue, I just want to ask, um, have you had a, a couple different opportunities to sit down with Manchester Police Department and talk to them about this conversation you have with the defendant? Yeah. Or with Adam Montgomery, I should say. All right. Um, and in that, at one point in time, had you indicated what that street was? Do you recall telling them what that street was? I've got a bad memory, I don't. <laughs> if I had a chance to, or if I could show you a report of that meeting that you had with police, do you think that might refresh your recollection mm -hmm. about what your memory is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Police report, and um, I'll just, I'm just going to move this over to the side if that's okay with you. And I'm going to show you a particular report 
Um, you remember meeting with uh, or having a, a phone conversation uh, with a police officer uh, and uh, an assistant attorney general just earlier this week? Mm -hmm. Okay. And during that, did you talk with them about um, your conversations with Adam Montgomery about guns? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like you to have a read through this particular um, report here. And um, I'm going to direct your attention just to the bottom half of the report. Yeah. Just for a moment. And then uh, look up whenever you're done. Okay. You fast reader. Okay. And let me restate the question now, and we'll see whether or not that refreshed your recollection. Do you recall when you were speaking with the police officers, um, again, as recently as this week, um, about what address or what street the defendant was living on when he had owned the rifle that he talked to you about? It was the Guilford Street address. Street on uh, Guilford Street address. Yeah. <coughs> that refreshes your recollection about mm -hmm. that and that conversation with the defendant. Yeah. All right. I just want to make sure I've got that accurately. Did he say where he kept the gun at that previous address? He said he was hiding them in the walls and stuff like that because he was worried that he was going to, I don't know, get in trouble. Well, I say, well, let me just go to... I'll be very specific, and I apologize. Sometimes my questions are too broad. Let me be more specific. Um, so the question that I wanted to ask was, did he say where he was keeping that gun? Not at, exactly. At the time he was living there, and I believe you just said in the walls. Is that right? Yeah. All right, so that's part number one. Um, uh, second from that, you mentioned a few moments ago something about the, the ATF or some statement about the ATF. Mm -hmm. What did the defendant say to you about the ATF? Um... He got kind of paranoid and was putting notes on people's cars. Hold, hold on a minute. I'm not asking about his actions. I just want to know. You said that he had gotten paranoid. I just want to know the statement. And let me be more clear. Did he say to you that he was concerned about the ATF? Yes. Okay. Did he ever tell you why he left the Guilford Street house? I think they got evicted or something. And when you had, how many of these conversations did you have with Adam Montgomery about this rifle, about these guns? Mm, once. Once, one time. Was there anybody else present there when you had that conversation? My fiance. Your fiance was there. Uh, was there anybody else there? Um, uh, any other adults or child or anyone? Kayla. Kayla. And the kids. Okay. They were running around. Okay, I want to make sure I, I heard that. So I thought you just said Kayla and the kids, but they were running around. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. And is, was Kayla next <coughs> to you and the defendant when you had these conversations with Tara there, or was she also <laughs> running around with the kids? Yeah, it was back and forth, but we're all right there on the oh. porch. And... Uh, whose porch? Your porch or Adam Montgomery's porch? My porch. Your porch. And that's the one at 137 Orange Street you showed us there? Yes. All right. Um, Last question for you, Mr. Zimmerman, with regards to Adam Montgomery. Is he in the courtroom today? Yes. Could you please point out what he's wearing and describe the color shirt he's wearing? Blue. Okay. And could you please point out generally where he is in the oh, courtroom? Sorry. Right there. Over there is inside. At this point, Your Honor, we'd ask the record to reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. The record shall so reflect. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. I don't have any further questions for you. I believe defense counsel will have a few. Thank you. How are you? Good. I'm Caroline Smith, and I don't have no. I don't have too many questions for you, but I did want to follow up on on one of the things that you said um, when you started answering questions um, with Mr. Agati, and he asked you what street Adam lived on when he was um, talking about not when he was talking, but where he was living when he said he had guns. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a bad one. So um, let me back up there to <laughs> make that a little easier. You said that this conversation happened with Adam uh, while you were at Union Avenue, right? He um, was at Union Avenue. Yes. yes. And you're at Orange Street. Yes. Side by side. Yeah. You have a conversation. And you said you had a conversation about some guns uh, or an AR-15 at Guilford, right? As street. 
No, it was at Orange Street I had the conversation. Right. Okay, that's what I didn't want to mess up with and made it even worse. But it was about activity that he said he was doing while at Guilford Street, right? Yes. And when Attorney Agati first asked you about where that activity was supposed to be happening, you said you couldn't remember you had a bad memory. With names. Okay. And um, you actually talked to a police officer, um, 531. So that was just a couple of days ago, right? Yep. And um, that was a phone call, right? Mm hmm While you were at your house. I was at work. Oh, you were at work? Yep. Okay. And um, during that phone call, uh, you were able to provide a name of a street. Yeah. Okay. And he was actually asking you questions about what street where he was living, right? Yeah. And um, so when you first talked to pol uh, I'm changing the subject a bit and moving too fast again, sorry. Uh, you recall that your wife was talked to police in March of 2022, right? Yep. And she told you about that conversation with the police, right? Yep. Because it's not a secret. You two share your lives together, right? Mm hmm And um, you were aware that um, Adam had been arrested, right? Yeah. You have to say that loud. And you were aware that Kayla had been arrested? Yes. And... Um, <coughs> uh, and you were aware that the police had talked to Tara? Mm-hmm, yes. And you were aware of what they talked to Tara about? Yeah, pretty much. She yep. told you the conversation <coughs> that she told the police, right? Mm-hmm. And you talked to the police in, and I brought the wrong one over, sorry. Um, September 26, 2022, right? Mm -hmm. That's give or take six months after Tara had that conversation with the police, right? Yep. And that's after you and Tara had talked about that conversation that she had with police, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is he? You may step down. Uh, is the state ready to call its next witness? We are, Your Honor. I'm just uh, here to go over our technology, but I think we should go ahead and get the witness on the stand and we'll do it when it comes up. So at this point, the state would I'd like to call Mr. Michael Doty to the stand, please. All right. Where the testimony you will give this jury to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. Yes. Okay. Please feel free to have a seat. <clears throat> Please state your full name, uh, spelling both your first and last for the record. Yep, it's Michael Doeb, M I C H A E L. Doeb, I apologize for the oh. mispronunciation. I'm no, sorry okay. about that. Uh, 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 Mr. Doeb, uh, currently, um, uh, what town do you live in? London Dairy. Okay, and how long have you lived there? 10 years about 10 years or so yeah all right and let me ask for you um, with, so the jury understands uh, your testimony here today uh, what field of work do you work in uh, asset protection asset protection uh, and for folks who are not familiar with asset protection uh, how would you explain that to them what is asset protection um, it's just another form of security our job is to uh, prevent uh, theft in retail stores 
what are some of the different <laughs> retail stores that you've worked in and for how long? Uh, I've been doing security and asset protection for about 15 years. I currently work at Macy's. And where are some of the different retailers that you have worked with before uh, going to Macy's? Yep. So prior to Macy's, I was with Walmart. I was with Walmart for a few years. And then prior to that was Rite Aid for nine and a half years. And then Kmart for a few years. Do you move around sometimes from store to store? Or are you located at one store when you have these jobs? Um, so Rite Aid, I move store to store. Uh, Walmart, I was assigned to only the Manchester location. And then Macy's, I'm only assigned to the Salem location. And what were the times or there? Excuse me. What years were you working for Walmart at that Manchester location? Uh, 2020 to 2022. Okay. And uh, so everybody knows, which location are we talking about? What street? Uh, 725 Gold Street in Manchester. Is that the one? So uh, for me to get there from here, which way would I go? Uh, I think the quickest way would to be go up, um, uh, I don't know what the side street is here, but straight up to Beach Street and then Beach Street all the way down to South Willow. South Willow uh, to uh, to like the Friendlies area, and then you take a right at Friendlies, and that brings you right to Walmart. Okay. Um, so how again? How long were you working at that particular Walmart? Uh, approximately two years. Two years. All right. Um, are you uh, from two years of working there? And, and I should say this: What are your average work weeks like? How many hours are you there in the store? Um, that varies, but typically I would say anywhere between forty and fifty hours a week. So is it fair to say you know the interior layout of that store fairly well? I do. All right. Um, I want to ask about a device at the very front of the store, I believe in the service area, called an Eco ATM. Yep. Are you familiar with that device? A little bit, yes. Could you explain to the jury what is an Eco ATM, uh, and at least what was it when you were there at Walmart? Yep. So the Eco ATM is a vendor service. Uh, it has nothing really to do with Walmart. It's not Walmart owned. But um, essentially, it's um, uh, a humanless pawn shop almost. You just put electronics in there. It gives you um, a dollar amount of what they value that electronic device to be. And then if you agree to its terms and payment, it keeps the electronic item, and then it gives you the money. So it's almost a place where I can turn in. If I was tired of my phone and decided all right, this is it, I want to get rid of it. I could go there and get money from my phone at one of these devices? You can, yes. Okay. And is that something that's in multiple Walmarts or just that particular Walmart? Uh, to be honest, I don't know if it's at multiple Walmarts, but we did have it in ours, and it's also used in various other locations. Okay. Um, at some point in time, and specifically, actually, in early January of 2022, were you contacted by Manchester Police Departments with regards to an ongoing investigation they had? Yes. And did they ask you to retrieve any sort of records that Walmart had about eco ATM transactions between December 30th and December 31st of 2021, just the month prior? They did, yes. Okay. And what did you do uh, to assist in that investigation? Um, I believe they gave me dates and times to look at, and then... Um I uh, burned those videos and any uh, camera frame relating into that area, and then I provided it to Manchester Police. When you say camera frame relating to that area, what do you mean by that? Uh, the service desk where the Eco ATM machine was. And in addition to that footage from the service area, uh, were you able to look at other cameras that were recording um, from that same time period? Like, I are was. you able to? For lack of a better term, are you able to basically follow somebody through the school store from different recording to different recording? I was able to do that, yes. Okay. Were you able to do that for the Eco ATM transaction and the people involved with that transaction that you saw on the video? I was. And what did you do with that uh, video footage once you had it? I provided it to the Manchester Police Department. Exhibit one for identification purposes only, and I'm going to 
going to go ahead and hand you that. And feel free to take the uh, DVD or the CD uh, out of the sleeve. Just want to have you take a look at it. Do you recognize that DVD or, or CD? I do. Okay. How do you recognize it? Uh, my initials and data are on it. Have you watched the video content that's on that CD? I have. What is the video content on that CD? Uh, the video that I provided the Manchester Police Department. The one that we're talking about here for this transaction? Correct. Okay. And um, uh, again, at the very front of the CD, did you do anything to mark it so you know that that's the same CD that you viewed? Yep. I uh, initialed it and signed it. Okay. Um, go ahead and take that back from me, please. Thank you. And the video footage that you viewed on here, is that a full and accurate representation of the video footage that you provided to the Manchester Police Department relative to this investigation they asked you? It is. At this point in time, Your Honor, I believe the defense would like to approach. Okay. Question. I'm sorry, half of us are still up here. That's okay. Um, the footage that you pulled for the Manchester Police Department in relation to the investigation they asked you for, did you view that footage before you gave it to Manchester? <laughs> I had to in order to burn it, so yes. Okay, thank you. No objection. All right, the ID is stricken. Exhibit one is entered as a full exhibit. understanding of uh, council's agreement, what I'd like to do is just briefly have a quick second. We're going to take the contents of that particular CD, the full contents of that CD, go ahead and put it on a blank folder area here so that we can view the videos without viewing the other content of the computer. We discussed before about that and also there's an incredible lag time when trying to play from a CD wall uh, that may interfere with the video for the jury to be able to see it. So we want to eliminate that by making it play immediately off of the hard drive. Okay. Just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, this is a good time to stand up and stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers are not known for their technical expertise. <laughs>
Thank you very much for the time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time for the council. Uh, with the rest of this, uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring over onto your screen here. tracks on this, and I believe the first one that you have entitled here was called Service Desk Overview Monitor. Um, what area of the store does that come from? So the service desk is located in the front of the store. And separate from that, do you have video cameras that cover the entrance of the store? We do. Do you have cameras that cover the different aisles inside Walmart? Or did you, I should say, I'm sorry, past tense, did you? We did, yes. And what about individuals who are exiting the store? Did you have cameras that cover that area as well? Correct. Um, I'm going to start by playing an entrance video. Uh, what you reported here, specifically for the record, I'm referring to entrance general merchandise uh, uh, underscore zero two underscore twelve dot thirty dot twenty twenty one. Uh, 13 dot 55 dot 14 underscore 12 dot 30 dot 2021 dot 13 dot 55 dot 20 underscore and we're going to hit play on this track yep again this is entrance general merchandise particular moment seven seconds into this track um, do we see three individuals coming into the store here we do okay. and these three individuals are these the three individuals that you then were able to follow on cameras throughout their time at the store that day that is correct yes okay. this general entrance that they're coming through uh, where's that located in the store and I know it might sound like a strange question but the side of the store the back of the store the front of the store so it is the front of the store and that is our general merchandise uh, entrance is there a second entrance for Walmart? There is, there's a grocery entrance, which is also in the front. I'll play that track again from the beginning without pausing. And from there, I'd like to ask, do you also have another camera separate from one here that shows individuals coming in? that is at different heights within the store. Maybe not one that's as low as this, but do you have ones that are higher, maybe ones that are lower? Yeah, we uh, the store had various types of cameras, ones that were low, uh, eye level, and high up. And high up. Okay. Um, I'd like to play for you now a track, I believe it's also, tell us where this is in the local store. The track name is PTZ underscore 17 underscore 12 dot 30 dot 2021 dot. 13.55.15 to 12.30. 13.55.56. What does this area depict here? So this is also the, this is the same entrance that we just saw. It's the general merchandise uh, entrance. It's just a different camera view. Again, that's the general merchandise area, you said? Correct. And the door um, that's in the vestibule is the AP office. And I'm going to go ahead and um, you 
said that there is a door to the AP office. And I was wondering if you don't mind just kind of stepping up uh, for a moment, come down and show us where that door is. You know, pausing the video uh, specifically at 12 seconds into the track. Right there, you're pointing to the left-hand side of the screen? Correct, that would have been our office. Could you show us that again? Yep. And from that, can we see the same three individuals who had just come in the entrance a second ago? We can. Could you clean this to the track? <clears throat> Could you see where these people went after they came into the school? If I remember correctly, they went straight to the service desk area. And we've got a video of that service desk area? Yes. for you now the area, the area called Service Desk Overview Monitor 1230-2021.13.5550-32, same day 12-30-2021, 14-21.42. Are we now watching this? Is this the service area that you talked about? This is. Okay. I'd like to pause it just for a brief second, about <clears throat> six seconds into the video. Uh, can you tell us what are the different areas that we can see here on this video? What what areas do the camera does the camera cover? Yep. Uh, do you mind if I get up? And if you could, please. Thank you. So this is the service desk right here. This is the lower left hand side of the screen. This is the Eco ATM machine, and then this is the front end registers behind. So the front end register, as you said, in behind. So that's is that a where I would go to pay if I wanted to leave the store. Correct. All right. And could you point out the Eco ATM machine again? Yep. So I'm going to start playing the video again, continuing on for six seconds. And as we watch the section of the video, could you tell us whether you see the same three individuals we've talked about already come over to the Eco ATM machine? I do. And again, this is footage that you reviewed before you give it to the Manchester Police Department and before uh, you reviewed this CD. Correct. Approximately how long does it take to conduct one of these ECO ATM transactions? Based on your experience having worked with this group? Um, I mean, based on my experience, I would say anywhere between five and 10 minutes. Five and 10 minutes? I would say, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. This particular track is, so I'm reading this correctly, tell me if I'm right at the bottom of the screen, 33 minutes and 55 seconds long, is that correct? Correct. Having uh, watched this portion of the video um, going through, without us sitting here for 33 minutes and 55 seconds to watch all of it, um, do you see these same individuals here at this machine or at least one or more of those individuals here at this machine throughout this entire 33 seconds? I do, yes. Okay. And who's the individual or individuals who are standing at that machine the entire time? Who are they? I'm sorry, uh, could you point out which individual it is? No, I'm not asking about their names. Um, um, right now it looks like the two females are standing there. One in a blue, light blue shirt, long sleeve and a maybe a darker blue a jacket. Could you go ahead and, and point those two individuals out? I'm just going to leave it playing while you do so. And they were just showing by a male. Uh, these two women, and then the male with the hat. <coughs> what color is that hat? To uh, I would say tan. <coughs> what I would like to do is, uh, in regards to this transaction, I'd like to go ahead and speed up the video if I can. Yep. And just to allow you to be able to see it. So let me <clears throat> I'll tell you what, Mr. Dope, I, maybe it would be more efficient if I go ahead and start jumping forward in different times. Okay. You've watched this video. Uh, the individual in the light blue that we see there with the bright colored bag, um, is she there at this Eco ATM throughout the entire video? Yes. And what about the uh, other uh, woman that's in the dark blue jacket and the gentleman in the hat? Uh, the one in the darker blue, I believe, also stays the whole time. The gentleman in the hat uh, varies. He leaves and comes back throughout the video. Well, I'd like to go ahead and uh, jump forward now uh, 
kind of specifically come up to an area approximately 29 minutes in. <coughs> We're now 19 minutes in, uh, in 25 seconds. Do you still see uh, uh, the, the uh, two female individuals there? Yes. At the ATM? And can you point out where they are? Oh, they're at the Eco ATM machine. You jump forward now in time. Now looking at 22 minutes and 55 seconds in. Are those same two females still there at the ATM machine? They are. minutes and 45 seconds and are they still there at the ATM machine? They are. Do you see that same gentleman in the tan hat? I do. Okay. Can you please point him out? Yep. He's the one walking away in the staff t-shirt. I do. And now jumping forward to 2816. Are they both still there at the ATM? And could you point them out, please? Yep, they are, and they are still both at the Eco ATM. <laughs> Stay there just for a second. Tell me if you see the individual with the tan hat come back into view of this camera. I do. Could you please point him out for us? You still see the individual with the tan hat? I do. And at that point, is that individual now off the screen? We're standing here at 3100. He has along with the female in the dark blue jacket. Okay. Did you follow the two of them as they went through the store? I believe I did, yes. And is that part of the video footage you provided to the Manchester Police Department? Yes. This camera angle and where you were for this, um, how high is this particular camera? Uh, this camera is probably maybe about 10 feet off the floor. Do you have other cameras that are closer that could see more facial features than what we can see here? Yes. Okay. Do you have any in the uh, cosmetics department that include that? Yes. Uh, might we be able to see the person's face or any of these people's faces if they walk through one of those cosmetic cameras? Yes. At this point, I'd like to play another track for you. Attorney Agati, I'm going to ask you to approach for just a minute. Yes, Council approach. <laughs>
and it's five after four. Um, so I've spoke to the lawyers. I think this is a good time to end for the day. Um, once again, I'm going to remind you, don't discuss the case, not with anybody else, uh, not with each other. Uh, don't do any independent research. Don't drive by any locations. Uh, don't look up the law. As, as you've been instructed, you will have all the information you need to decide this case at the conclusion of this case. It is, uh, again, incredibly important that you avoid any newspaper, television, uh, or online coverage of this case. and. Uh, there is some out there, so I really want you to pay close attention to not viewing uh, any of it, okay? Um, having said that, uh, I wish you all a very good weekend. Thank you so much for your time and attention this week. We'll uh, have you back here at 845 on Monday morning for a 9 a.m. start. Again, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. All rise for the jurors, please. <laughs> step down. The lawyers are going to tell you we're going to need to have you come back on Monday. Okay. I think we just weren't going to get it all in before the end of today. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, okay, that's that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, I don't think we have anything up there. Anything we need to do uh, today? No? Everybody's? No, nothing? Good. Okay. So Mr. Montgomery can go back. Oh, there is one that I want him to remember if I got it right. I did not 